Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. You are now in a webinar on Understanding Grief 6, Mental Health Toolkit for the Family. This is being presented by the EPCOM Adult Leukemia Foundation of the Philippines in cooperation with the Philippine College of Physicians and the Philippine Pediatric Society. We will now have the opening prayer to be led by our EPCOM Spiritual Director, Pastor Benny Lagos. Aloha from Kailua, Hawaii. Uh, my name is Benny Lagos. I am the spiritual advisor uh, for EPCOM. I know that this past year has been, been very, very difficult, difficult for, for so many, many people. It's been an oppressing year. It's been a depressing year. And for some of us, it's been even a tragic year. So I just want to encourage each and every one of you. Uh, for those of us who have gone through a depressing time, know someone who uh, is in a depressed state, I want to encourage each and every one of us to turn to the one who gives peace in the midst of um, challenge, who gives clarity in the midst of confusion. I want to turn our hearts to God because He's the one who knows our every challenge. He knows our every pain. He knows our every fear. So as you... Uh, as you go through uh, this symposium, I want you to listen with fresh ears and with a fresh heart because there are people who need to hear what you're about to hear. Let's open in prayer. Father, we thank you so much for this time. We thank you, Father, that uh, you have sent people across our paths that will not only give us knowledge, but will also encourage us in our walk. You know everyone's hurt. You know everyone's pain. You know everyone's travail. So Lord, we lift those up to you right now. For the people on this video, Lord, that you would touch them supernaturally, give them supernatural wisdom to deal with so many people who are hurting and who are dying. So Lord, we look to you. You are our ultimate source. Yes, we trust the doctors. Yes, we trust the medicines. But more than that, Father, we trust you because you are our eternal and heavenly healer. So we thank you, Lord, for what you're about to do in each and every one of our lives. Lord, use all of us for the expansion of heaven's borders. Use us, Father, mightily for your glory. In your son's precious name we pray, amen. Wishing you all God's best. Aloha. Let us now listen to the welcome message from the EPCOM founder and board chair and the advocacy committee chair of the Philippine College of Physicians. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Erlene Cabanag Dimere. Good afternoon, everyone. Hope you're all comfortably seated and ready to learn from today's activity. If you notice, to set the mood, I'm wearing green in support of mental health, green being its advocacy color, and I have an orange ribbon to signify the advocacy for leukemia. So now you see why our colors are a blend of orange and green, because it's a blending of the advocacy of mental health and leukemia. So in behalf of the organizers of this webinar, the EPCOM board, the Philippine College of Physician uh, President, Dr. Mario Panaligan and his current board, the Philippine Pediatric Society Board of Directors, I welcome you all to Understanding Grief 6. Now EPCOM Adult Leukemia Foundation has been serving leukemia patients and their families for 16 years now through three arms of service the medical arm, the resource mobilization arm, and the spiritual arm. EPCOM has seen so much grief and illness and loss of loved ones in our service to leukemia patients, their families, and the community. That is why EPCOM developed the Understanding Grief series, because EPCOM recognizes the multifaceted aspects of grief that all of us go through at some point of our lives, not necessarily a mental health challenge for most of us, but it is still grief, and grief has to be processed. Hence, in 2013, in line with the eighth year anniversary of EPCOM, God opened a way for us to bring to the Philippines Mel Erickson all the way from Seattle 
for the first Understanding Grief conference. She came back the following year for UG2, and now we are so privileged to, ha to have her back for Understanding Grief 6, though virtually. So this was in line with our um, anniversary of EPCOM. Understanding Grief 1, or UG1, was the first ever event that EPCOM um, led to deal with grief awareness on a national level. This was in cooperation with St. Luke's Medical Center, Global City, and was staged at the Henry C. Auditorium. The two days was not even enough to deal with very relevant and interesting topics addressing grief in many forms, as you see in the slide. Now, this was complemented by a session on the spiritual approach to grief by Reverend Isagani Dislate, who at the time was the senior pastor of the Ellenwood Malati Church, and now he is the senior pastor of National City United Church, or NCUC, which is a partner church of EPCOM, along with Ellenwood Malati Church and the Union Church of Manila. These partner churches help EPCOM's spiritual arm for prayer requests, visitations, and even counseling. As an offshoot of UG1, therefore, the Ellenwood Malati Church and the Union Church of Manila embarked on the program Grief Share, which is designed as a church-initiated grief management resource. Now, UG1 was indeed a powerful and blessed two days for parents, psychologists, counselors, and even doctors, and grieving people from all walks of life. Group activities like blowing bubbles helped attendees identify and face their grief. It was at this time also that EPCOM was joined by two celebrities, as you see in the slide, who are now EPCOM's goodwill ambassadors. The King of Talk, Boy Abunda, graced the conference by helping the audience see the challenges, grief, pain, and triumphs in the leukemia journey that EPCOM has been called to address. The concert king, Martin Rivera, broke the heavy air with his healing voice as he generously shared his songs together with his twin, Vicky. Now, to this day, Boy and Martin are strong advocates and our goodwill ambassadors. Now, Understanding Reef 2 came in the following year. We must have been doing something good. We must have been doing the right thing because there was really a clamor for another conference. So EPCOM brought the whole team to Dumaguete for Understanding Reef 2, Dumaguete Bound, Journey to Wholeness. It was a three-day event to feed the three aspects of our human state, the mind, the spirit, and the body. The mind, with a two-day grief conference, the spirit with a healing through music concert, and the body with a gentle mile run. The concept of the mind, spirit, and body, in a way, represents the three arms of service that EPCOM offers to leukemia patients and their families. The medical, the resource mobilization, and the spiritual arm. So let's go to the mind. When one is sick, not knowing what to do and where to get finances for treatment, the mind is perplexed, and that is grief. So the mind here is represented by EPCOM's resource mobilization arm, headed by Saniku, to help leukemia families raise funds for their needs and somehow alleviate grief by meeting some of their financial challenges. Through the UG series, EPCOM aims to raise funds while also addressing the anxiety and grief experienced by leukemia families born out of the high financial demand of the illness, as well as to increase mental health literacy of the Filipinos by bringing these grief conferences on a nationwide stand. Now, UG2 was actually staged at the Silliman Hall in cooperation with Silliman University, with then Dr. Ben Malayang supporting the program. That this was also a going back to the roots of EPCOM sort of thing, Dumaguete City, the hometown of attorney Erwin Cabanag, who succumbed to leukemia in, on May 12, 2005, and in his memory, EPCOM was born. Now, Boy Abunda at this time did an ex exclusive interview of Martin Nivera, who was so candid in sharing his personal grief journey and even declared himself the king of grief. The spirit, the grace for life, healing through music with EPCOM Goodwill Ambassador Martin Vera, EPCOM Advocate Judge Jenny Del Reno, and the acting 
Pamana Choral Group, led by their director, Elizabeth Susan Vista Suarez. It was a beautiful e evening of soothing music, gift of talents, and moving testimonies. EPCOM's spiritual arm is really the core and strength of EPCOM services, headed by Pastor Benny Lagos. This arm aims to help leukemia patients, volunteers, and staff manage grief through the building and growing of their faith in Jesus. EPCOM uh, conducts regular family huddles as a venue for leukemia families, volunteers, and members to experience healing through sharing and loving and just being there, just being present for each other. Now, in the pandemic, EPCOM continues to conduct, conduct um, monthly virtual family huddles and distribute whole packs for leukemia families. Whole packs are really meant to feed the body and the spirit with spiritual tracks that we put in a bag, Bibles, self-care items, protective masks and shields, and food. Now, donations for the whole packs are more than welcome. The Buddy, the Gentle Mile was a fun run for 3, 5, 10, and 50 kilometers to raise funds for EPCOM as well as an advocacy for physical and mental health. This was led by Coach Rio in cooperation with Unilab. We also had a virtual run conducted simultaneously. Now, the Gentle Mile really represents the medical arm that is headed by Dr. K. Rosales. Uh, our board of director, as well as a, he, she is a hematologist. This arm of EPCOM aims to address the physical needs of the leukemia patient through free medical consults with our volunteer hematologists, assistance in blood products and medicines. Donations for the medical arm is much needed so as to help leukemia patients have a better fight. Okay, So in 2015, EPCOM was presented with a great need to meet the grief experience of adolescents in the Philippines, and even just to understand it, as anxiety, depression, self-harm, and suicide rose to alarming levels in the country. We also saw EPCOM teens growing, going through deep grief because of illness or losing a parent or loved one to leukemia. So in response to this felt need, God sent us a U.S. expert um, on teen grief, Dr. Bob Bauer, coming all the way from Seattle. And so we staged UG3, or Understanding Grief 3, the grief experience of adolescents in the Philippines. This was hosted by EPCOM Goodwill Ambassador Boyabunda and graced by Chucky Dreyfus and Jasmine Curtis Smith, among, among others who share their testimonies that were so encouraging. Now in, in uh, 2016, UG4 was themed Healing Through Prayer, led by EPCOM's spiritual director, Pastor Benny Lagos, in tandem with Pastor Hiram Pangilinan, the senior pastor of Church So Blessed, and this was held at the Edsa Shangri-La Hotel. As we unpacked grief and depression from illness, attendees were taught how to pray in faith for healing. It was a truly blessed time. Now, UG5, or Understanding Grief 5, responded to the stigma put on people living with mental health challenges. At some point, they have been blamed for their condition. They've been called their um, different names, right? Their symptoms have been referred to as a face or something they can control if they only try. And as mental health challenges and suicide escalated in the Philippines, especially in the teens, EPCOM partnered with the medical city to bring to the Philippines for the first time mental health first aid. The medical city's uh, president and CEO, Dr. Eugene Ramos, supported this very relevant and in-demand activity that filled the Barcelona auditorium to the brim. And EPCOM flew in certified mental health first aid instruct instructor, um, Mr. Tony Cloud, to help Filipinos increase their literacy for mental health and reduce the stigma attached to it. So EPCOM spiritual director, Pastor Benny Lagos and EPCOM advocate, Ms. Kuledesma shared their testimonies and lessons learned about caring for or going through mental health challenges. Now, Boy Abunda unraveled the mystery of people living with mental health challenges on Spotlight with Dr. Francis Dimalanta, 
who incidentally is our program director now for UG6, and Jasmine Curtis-Smith, to make people aware that mental health should not be a reason to discriminate or deny people equal rights in school or the workplace. This is the unwieldy power that mental health stigma holds, and this is the reason for the UG series now focusing on mental health. So in 2020, in line with the World Mental Health Day, which is actually uh, celebrated every October 10 of every year, okay, EPCOM, EPCOM continued to advocate in the pandemic. And being a hope-generating ministry, EPCOM staged Hope for Mental Health um, November 14, 2020. This was a webinar, okay, a virtual webinar. Although this was not dubbed under the UG series, um, EPCOM partnered at this time with, this was the first time that we partnered with the Philippine College of Physicians, whose flagship advocacy under its president, Dr. Mario Panaligan, is mental health. Now, mental health stigma make people feel ashamed, you know that, for something that is really out of their control. Worst of all, stigma prevents people from seeking the help they need. Now, for a group of people who already carry such a heavy burden, stigma is really an unacceptable addition to their pain. That is why EPCOM gathered mothers to tell their story, the pain of dealing with family members with mental health or going through mental health challenges themselves. This was hosted by um, TJ Manotto, who is now a mental health advocate after experiencing and conquering depression. TJ's mom, Aurora P1, shared for the first time how she handled the difficult years of his son and the stigma attached to their story. Among the other mothers who shared were Angeli Pangalinan, who candidly and eloquently revealed her side of handling a celebrity husband and kids with various needs and challenges. Actor Charmaine Buencamino also shared how she rose from despair of losing a child to suicide to an advocacy of helping those who are struggling. It would have been really a heavy session if not for the uplifting songs of Martin Rivera, Pops Fernandez, Kuli Desma, Stephen Koo, and Pops Susara. Now, while stigma has been reduced in the recent years, there are many advocacy groups already um, doing mental health awareness campaigns and webinars. Still, the pace of progress has not been quick enough. There is still stigma. Hence, we really need to collaborate and network to be able to promote to a national level mental health awareness and drive um, this awareness to reduce stigma and give the proper treatment to people living with mental health challenges. Now, EPCOM has partnered with like-minded groups for this otherwise daunting task the Philippine College of Physicians, and now joined in by the Philippine Pediatric Society with Dr. Francis de Malanta of the Philippine Pediatric Society and head of the Task Force on Mental Health in Children and Youth, and the Philippine Psychiatric Association with Dr. Benjamin Vista and most of our speakers this afternoon. So this webinar is really a product of this collaboration. And this is just the start of a series of webinars to address mental health in the different stages in life, focusing around the family. Again, let me welcome you all to UG6. Stay on to the end for the speakers have prepared for you practical tips to put into your mental health toolkit for your family that you can use whenever you need it. So congratulations to all of you for tuning in and being part of this event. God bless. Thank you so much, Dr. Dimere. Before we proceed with the five lectures this afternoon, let us first listen to the special performance by our EPCOM ambassador, friends, ladies and gentlemen, the one and the only concert king, Martin Nievera. You know, when I think about grief and understanding grief, from a man in my position, when I'm always out and, and I'm always promoting happiness and love and life and, and positivity when being positive was in, uh, it's really hard sometimes to go through this time and during this pandemic, during all these lockdowns and, and not being able to spread the word. 
to continue my journey in trying to tell the world that no matter what happens, there will be another day. There's always a new day and something to look forward to. But I think in handling grief and all those mental challenges that we have during our lonely moments, it's once we've snapped out of it, and I think more people snap out of it than, than we can really count. When we do snap out of it, we've got to take it upon ourselves to go out and look for that happiness, to look for that sunshine, to want. You have to want to get better. You have to want for better days to come. You can't just wait for it to come and get you. So my advice would be get up off the seat and go out and look for it. It's waiting for you. What is it? You know what it is. I never really wondered what went on around me and I never really bothered to give it any thought if ever you wanted a helping hand just look around and you will see it everywhere you gotta look for me get by yourself get everyone with it if you really really want to get there I tried my best to find it but you were never, never there to help me And I never had the strength To come around through your door If ever you wanted A helping hand Just look around and you will see it everywhere. You gotta look for it. Get by yourself, get everyone with it. If you really, really wanna get there. So on behalf of my EPCOM family, together with the Philippine College of Physicians and the Philippine Pediatric Society, more power to all of you. God bless you. Gotta look for it. Get by yourself. Get everyone with it. If you really, really want to get there, gotta look for it. Get by yourself, get everyone with it. If you really, really want to get there, gotta look forward. Get by yourself, get everyone with it. If you really, really want to get there, you gotta look forward. Get by yourself, get everyone with it. If you really, really want to get there God bless you all. Thank you for being so generous with your talent and sharing with us this afternoon and in our past events. The program director and moderator for our webinar is a fellow and trustee of the Philippine Pediatric Society fellow and trustee of the Philippine Society for Developmental and Behavioral Pediatrics. He is affiliated with the St. Luke's Medical Center of Quezon City and Global City, and he is also the head of the Section on Developmental and Behavioral Pediatrics of the Philippine Children's Hospital. We now turn you over to Dr. Francis Xavier Dimalanta. Good afternoon, everyone. 
We have experienced an unprecedented disruption in our lives during the past 15 months of the COVID-19 pandemic, including tragic loss, heartache, and suffering for so many. Our individual and collective well-being continues to be at great risk in these most challenging times. Our neurophysiological threat systems have been on continual high alert, and we've all been exposed to high levels of traumatic stress to one degree or another. As Dr. Benjamin Vista, my advisor who designed this conference, the rationale behind this is that the pandemic has given rise to hidden or less talked about pandemics of depression and addiction at all stages of life, especially the youth whose growth and development have been disrupted. Realizing the new role of the whole family in nurturing our youth, EPCOM is providing this discussion space where novel mental health approaches can be focused upon. Our general objective includes that at the end of this three-hour session, the participants would have learned and discussed strategies to cope and flourish in a pandemic along the developmental phases of life, which include pregnancy and infancy, early childhood, school age, adolescence, and adulthood. Specific objectives would include why we will be describing how persons at specific developmental phases have been challenged by this pandemic, to suggest how persons at specific developmental phases can cope and flourish in the pandemic, which includes the toolkit, and not limited to taking care of your own physical health, taking care of their mind, taking care of relationships, which include human-to-human, -human, environment, community, and God. Our keynote speaker is Mel Erickson, a published author of Kid Talk, a faith-based curriculum for grieving children. Our Story, a memory book as a tool to help children tell their story and process grief, and also 12 simple tips and tools to help your grieving child. For over 30 years, her passion has been working with bereaved children as she has spoken and delivered training internationally. She lives with her husband in Tacoma, Washington, USA. Our distinguished faculty include Riza Son Gotian Nang, a clinical psychologist, Dr. Ermenilda Avendano, who is the president of the Philippine Society for Developmental and Behavioral Pediatrics, Dr. Rodora Andrea Concepcion, the president of the Philippine Society for Child and Adolescent Psychiatrists, Dr. De Deborah Azan Red, who is the president of the Society uh, of uh, Adolescent and Medicine Specialists in the Philippines, and Dr. Robert Buenaventura, who is in the board of directors of the Philippine Psychiatric Association. We are certain that all of us will be enlightened this afternoon, and we thank all our speakers for sharing with us a mental health toolkit that we can all use in navigating life. So for our first speaker, navigating grief as a family, let us all welcome Mel Erickson. Hello, I'm Mel Erickson, a grief educator with a passion for helping bereaved children. Thank you for being here at Understanding Grief 6. Together, we can make a profound difference in the lives of children who are living with the death of someone important to them. The need was at a critical point before COVID-19 invaded our world. And now it is time for you and I to take action on behalf of these kids. Why? Because unresolved grief in a child is the number one cause of difficulties in school. It is often at the root of behavioral issues, even mimicking ADD and ADHD, childhood depression and suicide, relationship issues and risk-taking behaviors. So thank you for joining me in doing what we can to help children work through their pain, express their feelings, tell their story, and acquire coping skills through caring relationships. My goal today is to equip you with this important work 
with insights, hindsights, and tools. You will then be able to equip other caring adults. It is not rocket science, especially if you love working with kids. My plan is to give you a little knowledge foundation about how children grieve, then practical applications, all of which are found in greater detail in my books, the Kid Talk Faith-Based Curriculum, the Our Story Memory Book, and 12 Simple Tips and Tools to Help Your Grieving Child. These books are available on Amazon and will soon be on sale at reduced prices. So the slides will give you page references uh, to save you taking notes. And you can go to my website and subscribe and then get an exclusive URL so that you will get notices of the sale and have access to some free gifts that I have prepared for you. I'm pretty excited about sharing this with you. So. Before we begin, I do want to make a little disclaimer. I know that many, if not most of you, are professionals, and the quotable script that I use in my books, and for the most part today, is designed for kids. Talking with kids can seem a little gross, like when we discuss grief vomit and toilet bowl love. So thank you in advance for understanding that though I know you are educated adults, that I'm talking to you as if you were kids using words you can quote or rewrite to make your own. Let's begin with basic definitions so that we're all on the same page. What is grief? It is our internal response to separation and loss of someone or something we value or need. It impacts our thinking, our feelings, our physical bodies, our relationships, our faith, our interaction with the world around us, no matter how old we are. Grief is a major source of stress. Bereavement is grief for someone who has died. Let me point out that that person who has died is not always a loved one. One 12-year-old girl in a kid talk group screamed at us, he is not my loved one, I hate him. And from that moment on, we use the word deceiving to refer to our person who has died. We grieve in proportion to our attachment, not necessarily a love attachment. Mourning is the outward expression or behaviors of grief, such as crying, visiting the grave, talking about the person who died, doing something to remember the decedent. Mourning is grief work. And grief work is anything we do that helps us to diminish our grief, express it, and feel better. It is mourning behaviors, the way our internal grief finds expression, that moves us through the pain of grief towards healing. Examples, again, might be talking about the person who died, sharing memories, putting flowers on the grave, having a continuing link that reminds us or connects us to the decedent lighting a candle, much more. All of these are extremely important to do interactively with kids. So how does grief tie us into the pandemic? Well, Carl Jung said that every change is a loss and every loss must be grieved. We already know that children grieve the loss of family and divorce and changes in friendship, status, health, and much more. But what about the uninvited changes brought about by the pandemic? The loss of a sense of safety and security. Who else will die? All the uncertainties regarding health, the death of important people, shelter, food choices, the future, loss of stable income, home, school routine, friendships. Everything has changed in the pandemic. Every change is a loss and every loss must be these and more things um, related to the pandemic uh, create significant compound grief that must be addressed for our children to thrive. We all have a grief bundle, is what I like to call it, because grief attaches to grief all the way back to the cradle. Adult word alert, grief is cumulative. So, of course, we don't remember losses from our infancy or childhood, but the feeling experience is stored in our subconscious 
and may influence our future responses to separation and loss. The good news is that because grief attaches to grief, the more grief work we do, the more impact of historical grief diminishes. diminishes. I like to use a rainbow streamer for visual of this reality. And I'm going to weave my story into the pandemic story for you to see how effective this tool might be. This is a rainbow streamer, also known as a mouth coil, um, purchased from Magic Supply on Amazon. So when I was four years old, my grandma Stock, who lived with us, disappeared. She went to the hospital and died, but I was spared the story, devaluing me and my sense of belonging. And now I am adamant that children be included in the family story and told the truth. In third grade, Martin Van Winkle called me on the phone and said, I hate you, Mary Ellen Trickle, and I never want to speak to you again. I still remember that phone call. When I was 12, my parents put my dog at 12 years to sleep. And that same summer, my brother was killed. When I was 16, my dad died of lung cancer. When I was 24, my marriage nearly ended. At 40, my firstborn son died of a brain tumor. And six months later, my mom died of Alzheimer's. Seven years later, my second son was diagnosed with acute lymphoblastic leukemia. He's now 48. Five years after that, our nest was empty. And 14 months ago, everyone was getting sick with COVID-19. I couldn't meet with family or friends in person. I couldn't go to church or Bible study. The healthcare system didn't know what to do with sick people, didn't have space, didn't have drugs. People were dying and we couldn't say goodbye. The TV news was all bad. Friends died and we didn't get to say goodbye. Friends were out of work or didn't have money for rent or food. The shelves in the grocery store were often empty. My routine changed totally. I couldn't go places, period. I was stuck at home. And when I did go out, I had to wear a stupid mask. Worried about my grandkids. Worried about my kids who are both in health. My country is full of political conflict and discord. My status quo has gone. Yuck. See how hard it is to manage all this loss? This rainbow streamer is pretty. But let me tell you, trying to manage all this grief is not pretty at all. It's hard. Maybe you can't even remember what life was like before you had all this to do. And we expect children to deal with it themselves. They need and deserve our help. Let's take a look at six insights that I think are important, followed by six hindsights, and then six actionable tips, and then 12 activities to do with kids. But before we get, begin with insights and hindsights, Etc. Let's quickly review how we break bad news to children. This is so important. That's really quite simple. First, we signal a flashing yellow light. Caution. Prepare yourself for bad news. I used to call this a warning shot, but with all of the issues around guns these days, I call it a flashing yellow light. Remember when you got called into the principal's office? Maybe that never happened to you, but you knew, uh-oh, something's coming. So if mom says, honey, come sit down. I need to talk to you for a minute. Same reaction, uh-oh, <laughs> something's wrong. First, the yellow light. Second, we tell the story from the beginning through the critical incident. We use simple language and we tell the truth. Third, we are fully present for the response, for the fallout. And we offer comfort appropriate to our relationship with the child. And then fourth, we talk about what's next, our plan of action. For example, I might say, 
your aunt's coming to pick you up and take you to her house. And your daddy will come get you as soon as he's finished at the hospital. Four simple steps. The warning, the story, being present for the emotional fallout, and plan of action. Educate yourself about normal grief for a child so that you know when professional evaluation might be ended. That is insight number one. Remember that grief is unique and everyone in a family may handle it differently. Children grieve differently than adults. And we'll talk about that in a minute. I have here a list of normal behaviors that are common to grieving children, but not necessarily your grieving child. The behaviors in black font are flashing yellow lights. What matters is that we observe changes in a child. Now, I know the font is small on this slide, so I am going to put it on my website in your exclusive section. So you will have it um, later. Pay attention when others, friends or family, express concern about your child. It's very possible your own instincts might be a little corroded because of your own grief. Now, insight number two, children may not have words for feelings. They act out their grief. So again, we listen by observing their behaviors and noting change. Insight number three, tears are okay and even necessary. Although there is such a thing as dry tears, we need to cry until we're dry, period. We teach kids this rhyme at Kid Talk. Tears on the outside fall to the ground and are slowly swept away. Tears on the inside fall on the soul and stay and stay and stay. We talk about what that rhyme means. It's profound. We give the children copies to put on the refrigerator at home. Insight number four, healing from grief is a choice. We choose to lean in to grief and do the grief work. Our kids heal in direct proportion to how their family adults are healing. We are role models for our kids. Insight number five, grief is unique to the individual, the child, or adult. We have different loss histories and grief bundles, different coping tools, different alligators nipping at our heels, different support systems. There's no one way or right way to grieve. So a family of six may have six different grieving styles. Doesn't that make life interesting? Insight number six. Children grieve differently than adults. They may have delayed grief reactions. Six months to a year after a death, their behavior may reflect grief because their abstract thinking is not developed. Gone is an abstract concept. It takes time to absorb and understand gone. Children are, have magical thinking. They need to explain what has happened, and they are quick to come up with an explanation that may leave them feeling guilty. For example, I had a little boy in Kid Talk who thought it was his fault that his dad had a heart attack because he'd had an, argue with, an argument with his dad before he left for school the morning his dad died. It's so very important to screen her magical thinking when we're working with kids. And we place it with the truth. Children cannot sustain emotional pain over extended time like we adults can. They will be sobbing and brokenhearted one minute and then outside playing the next. Children will recycle their grief developmentally, reworking the story and processing their feelings with increased understanding. This is why I think that our story memory book is so very valuable. Enable, it enables a child to return to their grief, for example, inevitably in the teen years, 
to his documentation of his feelings and his story and rework them with newly acquired material. Children are reluctant to add to their adult's pain. They will stuff their own because they don't want to make mommy cry. Because children may not have words, again, their pain will be expressed in behavior. So it's so important to pay attention to these changes, acting out, withdrawal, uh, regression, etc. And regression is uh, typical in a grieving child, particularly a young grieving child. So let's look at six actionable tips, things that you and I can do with our grieving kids. And the first and so important thing is that we answer questions as they come up with the truth and then listen and observe with all our antennae to how the children respond. We validate a child's behaviors slash feelings with words. For example, you are really mad right now. Want to smash some ice cubes to get the mad out? Then we can talk about it. Feelings aren't wrong. They just are and they change. It's what we do with our feelings that matters. Number two, use the words dead and died, please. Euphemisms can feed magical thinking. For example, kids are pretty literal. And if you say grandpa passed away, the child may wonder when he's coming back. Talk about what dead means. And I have um, laid out a script for you in 12 Simple Tips and Tools that you're welcome to borrow or quote or rewrite. It's what I use when I'm talking to kids. Actionable tip number three, prepare a child for the service of remembrance. Again, I have laid out a script for you in 12 simple tips. Actionable tip number four, address the difficult questions that come with the death. Those are, who else will leave me? Who is going to love me? Will I be all right? I give you my answers to these questions in the book. Actionable tip number five, maintain your household schedule, rhythms, traditions, ground rules. Kids, our reality is nothing is the same, but we will never forget daddy either. We still have our family ground rules. We're still going to be kind and considerate, respectful of one another. As best we can, we're still going to have dinner at 6 o'clock. As best we can, I will attend your school activities. Know that I expect you to respect me, even though you're hurting. And kids, there isn't anything we can't talk about. Not anything we can't talk about. And of course, this is a wonderful time to affirm your faith. Again, reminding the kids that we are in this together, that God never leaves us or forsakes us according to the Bible. And again, I have script for this uh, in the book. So now the fun part, 12 activities that um, are in 12 Simple Tips and Tools. But there are 103 activities, including the Our Story Memory, Our Story Memory book, um, in the curriculum. So the first is My Silent Hurting Heart. And what we do is give the children two paper hearts. Uh, the kids like red paper, of course. And we invite them to tear one apart to demonstrate how their heart has been torn apart because someone important to them died. With the second heart, we instruct them to scribble on one side because we're going to put glue on that side and paste our broken hearts back together. So they might not want to make confetti. They might want to tear this heart for demonstration purposes in just a few pieces. 
And as the children are working, we comment, wow, it's a lot of work putting a broken heart together. We're not sure exactly how to do it, are we? Sometimes we need help. Mm -hmm. Is this broken heart? It sure doesn't look the same. Will it ever be the same? Can it still love again? Conversation. Just Ducky. This uh, picture is in the book. We send it home with kids for the refrigerator. You will find it on your exclusive place on my website. I think it teaches an important concept. First of all, we get to talk about what bereaved means because bereaved people may look smooth, posed and unruffled on the outside and underneath paddling like crazy. We use a smile on a stick and take our pictures as another way to emphasize that what we show to the world and what we're feeling on the inside may be quite different. And it validates that important reality for children. We always do acrostics with our kids. When they first come, probably at the first or second session, we have them do an acrostic about themselves to describe who they are, to introduce them to the other kids and leaders in the group. An acrostic is a wonderful way to paint a word picture of a person in, in a pretty concise way. Down the road in the session when we're talking about the decedent, we have the children make an acrostic for the decedent, for the person who died. And again, it's a wonderful way to paint a word picture of the person who died. And often the children ask family to do the same so the family can change, um, share their perception of a person who died. I love creating dialogue in the family, because that means the family is doing great work together. And I think that is so very important. So activity number four is favorite things. Um, we have a list in the Our Story book. What was grandpa's favorite radio program? What was his favorite car? What was his favorite music? Who were his favorite people? What was his favorite thing to do in the spare time? What was his favorite food, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now again, the child may not have all the answers, so they can ask the family at home, and it can become a family conversation talking about favorite things. Activity number five, a handful of memories. This is so very simple. We just trace our hand on a piece of paper, and some of the kids like to put the name of the decedent in the center, and then write a memory in each finger. So we have a handful of memories. Activity number six, 20 questions. A memory game where you get 20 questions to ask about a time together as a family that have to be yes, no answers. So we did this many, many times in the car driving to grandma's house. Um, and the first question was always, was it before Donnie died or after? Was it before Donnie died? Yes, no. Was it at grandma's house? Yes, no. Were we celebrating somebody's birthday? Yes, no. You get the gist. What happened was we discovered memories the children held dear that we didn't know about. Um, it was just a really good way to honor the importance of the person who has gone physically, but very much in our hearts and we still love them. Grief vomit bags. A paper sack with grief vomit written on it. Grief vomit happens, folks. It's when our grief surges out of us without warning. We weren't even expecting it. It may be unkind words. It may be uh, unkind acts or deeds towards a sibling or family member. But it's important that families recognize some of this kind of behavior of grief is indeed grief, vomit. And our ground rule as a family is that we get unlimited take backs. Yep. 
when you shoot your loaded gun at me and I, and you say you never you ought you shouldn't you always ah, you get to say uh oh that was grief on it can I take it back unlimited take backs that's the ground rule okay and this leads right into toilet bowl love we ask the kids and you will get this graphic in your exclusive spot on my website. We ask the kids, what happens to a toilet that we don't flush? Well, it gets gross, doesn't it? If we hold anger and resentment inside of us because we've been hurt or somebody has hurt us or done something unfair towards us, we get yucky inside, just like an unflushed toilet. It's important that we forgive, not only forgive, but let go. The Bible says when God forgives, our wrongs, our sins are as far as the East is from the West. We're humans, and that's not true for us. We remember over and over again, and every time we remember, we have to forgive again and flush again. Let it go. We use magnetic toilets. In kid talk because the kids love to press down the handle and make the flush sound. But we also teach them that they can flush in pantomime. Or they can even go into the bathroom and use the real toilet and speak what they need to offload into the toilet and flush it away. Sounds silly, doesn't it? Guess what? Can't be silly and mad at the same time. Can't do it. It's a toggle. A letter to the decedent. This is one of the favorite activities that the children do. They write a letter, we give them pretty stationary. And we suggest that they might want to say, I will always remember, or I wish that, if only, I regret that. So those are important things that a child might want to say. And we use... Um, 10 inch square doilies with a colorful napkin inside the corners folded in held down with a sticker to make a special window. the kids love making these special letters to the deceased sometimes we take the rough draft and take it outside and burn it in hibachi to send our letters off symbolically to the person who died it helps bring closure and it helps um, it's a way to memorialize and send love. Because see, our love does not turn off like a faucet when somebody dies. And so at almost every Kid Talk session, we give the child a way to memorialize, to share their love, to express their feelings towards the person who died. Happy snaps are something that uh, we do at the end of every Kid Talk session. But they're appropriately done at the family table as well. A happy snap is when you close your eyes and you think of a time when you were interacting or watching the person who died and it made you smile. So it's a happy snapshot in your mind's eye. Um, this handful of memories is a repeat, isn't it? Whoops, we already did that. So let's close with love bubbles. We use little one ounce bottles of bubbles and we fill the air with love bubbles. I love you, Grandpa. And then we start loving on each other. I love you, Mom. Good work. I want you to know we did this at Understanding Grief with a room full of people. And it was delightful to see the air full of love bubbles. We were loving people who weren't here with us anymore. We were loving each other. We were loving speakers. It was great. So now in closing, I want to give you an invitation, a gift, and a challenge. Thank you again for your heart for grieving children and your willingness to reach out to them. We sure don't have to look very far to find children who would benefit from what we've talked about today. You and I can make a difference. So I want to welcome you to my website that has, as I have 
said, an exclusive resource section just for the owners of the Kid Talk curriculum and yet another section just for you with the handouts that I've referred to today. Um, in the resource section for owners of the Kid Talk curriculum, you find everything you need for 14 interactive two-hour sessions with kids. So I would invite you to subscribe so that you can get my newsletter with tips and tools, updates on special offers. And always I will be offering more and more activities to do with baby kids. So today um, I am offering you on your exclusive place on the website. Um, when you subscribe to my newsletter, Brief Talk, um, at this link, you will be able to download PDF of the feeling cards. There are 32 of them that you will receive as a PDF. And they are most effective in helping children find words for their feelings. So it's an advanced thank you gift for choosing to enlarge your two, two box um, for doing grief work with children. And I challenge you to reach out to a grieving child or family. Give them your caring presence using activities you've learned today and the dozens more that are found in the curriculum. And I look forward to hearing from you. Let's talk. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mel, for helping us and teaching us things to navigate grief and help our children. So our next speaker is Riza Zon Go Tian Nang, who will be lecturing on SAVE, understanding the needs of infants and toddlers in the midst of quarantine. She's a clinical psychologist and part-time faculty at the Ateneo Psychology Department, a founding member of the Philippine Association for Child and Play Therapy, and is a clinical psychologist at the Ateneo Bulatao Center. She completed her Bachelor of Science in Family Life and Child Development at the UP Diliman and her Master's in Child and Family Development at the Ateneo de Manila University. So let's give a warm virtual welcome to Ms. Riza Zon Go Tian Nang. Hello and good afternoon to everybody. I am Riza Zon Go Tian Nang and I'm the, your speaker today in discussing all about the needs of the infant and the toddler. And I would like to thank the EPCOM um, together with the Philippine College of Physicians and the Philippine Pediatric Society for this invitation to include me as a clinical psychologist to share about the needs of the young children. And so I would like to start in discussing what it means to parent the whole child. You know, in this pandemic, it is really such a challenge on how is it that we can parent our children within the confines of our house. Unlike before, the children go off to play in the park. They might go to uh, the, their, their daycare centers or their preschool. But for the past more than one year, the children have just really been in our house, in the room. And um, you know, the, their socialization, their interaction, and their learning may have indeed been impeded. But um, in the midst of this very challenging time for us, we still have to embrace our role in parenting the whole child. What do I mean by the whole child? Parents have to be mindful that we have to focus on the whole development and the growth of our children while looking out for our own health as parents. When we say whole development, we just don't focus on their cognitive development. We also have to consider their physical development, their social, their emotional, and their psychological needs. And another point that I would like to emphasize, especially for today's topic, where we consider the developmental needs of children, um, you know, as they age, their needs also change. Toddlers would have different needs compared to adolescents. So to those of you who are parenting um, children of various ages or who might have patients 
um, or, and their children vary greatly from preschool to grade school. We have to encourage the parents to be mindful about the, the developmental needs as well as to look at the child as a whole. And um, my focus of the talk today is to understand the challenges of parenting infants and toddlers with special focus for children aged 0 to 3 years old. Now, it is at this age where you have the young toddler. And um, as infants and toddlers, they're just really like moving around, crawling here, crawling there, toddling over here and there. And um, this is the time where the sensory motor development is very crucial for infant development. And what do we mean by sensory motor development? It is to support the children's need for motor movement so that we encourage their sensorial development. This is because uh, this is the stage of the multimodal perception and action that are coupled, meaning infants sense to move and they need to move so that they can sense. We see how infants would crawl and approach a toy. And from that toy, they're going to like bang it. They're going to be looking at it and they're going to even want to put it in their mouth. These are means of children in, of interacting with their toys so that as they sense their toy and they're interacting with that toy, in their minds, they're already creating their and developing their schema, the schema theory where... Um, we want to promote their object permanence as well as to consider the way that they assimilate and accommodate their experiences. When we say object permanence, it is to allow the children to believe that objects exist even if it is uh, something that's not visible to them. And this builds into their cognitive development of assimilation and accommodation that they can bring what they know outwards and then they're able to shift the schema that they know into their their mind again so that they continue to expand their knowledge their interest as they as they interact with their environment and it is also uh, very important that children as young as infants are allowed to play because play integrates all the senses in an infant. And I will expound more about play in a little while. In the next slide, I also want to encourage that even though we are quarantined, the family is still the most significant unit. It is through the interaction of the parents with the young child that allows the child to scaffold their competencies and their abilities. They're able to build up their skills from a lower into a higher, more mature, and more highly developed skills. And it is also the family that establishes the attachment that a child needs to develop their social and their emotional development. It's also the family that provides language development for children in the way that they serve and they return the interactions. Language can be, you can see language developing from receptive to more expressive skills. Even as simple as pointing, even as simple thing as touching a mother's face is already a child's attempt to, to communicate with the parent. And so even in quarantine, we are still able to fully utilize our special role as parents so that we can build on the whole development of the child. And most especially as a clinical psychologist, I really have to emphasize that even um, as young as infants and toddlers, we can help children by emotionally coaching them. When we see children having a tantrum or having a meltdown, let's allow the children to experience that emotion and let's coach them so that we allow the children to work through that emotion. Um, there's such a thing in, in psychology, and I think as, as pediatricians, we're aware of emotion regulation, where we begin with co-regulation and we share that regulation, we model that kind of regulation, so that eventually a young child learns to self-regulate. And it begins with the family. 
It begins with the parent who's able to identify and label those emotions and then validate those emotions that feeling angry, feeling sad are normal and acceptable emotions because that's a child's way of get of trusting their emotions, trusting their experience, and then working through with that emotion. Now, at this point, I'd like to share with you the different parenting styles that can form the special attachment between a child and a parent, because this is quite crucial for children at this age of infants and uh, toddlers. This is the most crucial of among all the facets of the whole child approach in development, that the attachment, the quality of attachment between a child and a parent is mediated by the parenting styles. So the first of the parenting styles is what we call indulgent. And in indulgent parenting, this is when parents are responsive to the needs of the children. In fact, um, in in uh, Filipino parenting, this can be observed when um, Filipino parents can be, you know, pinagbibigyan ang bata, binibigay sa bata yung gusto nila. Uh, but what is lacking here is the sense of control that a parent should be able to impose in a child. This is very important that parents have boundaries, they create structures, they have simple rules that a child should be able to follow. Like, um, asking a child to remain seated while they're eating. I think toddlers are able to observe that. No? Pagkakain, uh, nakaupo lang dapat ang bata. Um, they're allowed to hold their utensils, but then um, when you see that the child is beginning to be noisy and uh, you know throwing things around, then that's a the time that a parent should be able to instill already boundaries that you would say, Ayaw ni mama na binabagsak ang, ang kutsara. Kung hindi, kukunin ni mama yan. Hindi ibibigay sa iyo. So we have to um, be responsive, be warm, uh, but still be able to control a child's behavior through boundaries and um, limit setting. And uh, when a, ch a parent is less indulgent, then we're able to promote a more secure attachment in the child. Another type of parenting is what we call neglectful. A neglectful parent is one that is characterized as being unresponsive and having no control over the child. Um, ito yung nakikita natin na parang halos spoiled na yung bata, no? Because a parent is not truly responding to the needs of a child. Maybe... Um, superficially, a parent is responding, but it is not uh, attuned to the needs of the child. And there is lack of control in the child's behavior. Ito yung mga nakikita natin na yung hayaan mo na, hayaan mo na yung bata, pabayaan mo na. And, you know, having neglectful style of parenting may, may give parents the false belief that there is an attachment that the child develops with the parent, but because it is um, not truly responsive to the needs of the child and there is no control, then that kind of attachment can lead to uh, a disorienting style of um, attachment to the child because the child does not know his boundaries. Okay? Okay. A third parenting style is what we call authoritarian. I think a lot of Filipino parents also practice this. Yung, um, you know, the, 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 the rule of the parents is final and it is not negotiable. Um, this is characterized as being very responsive, but also very controlling. And the control is on the side of the parents. Ito yung mga narinig natin na, Basta hindi pwede. Basta sinabi ko. O, bawal yan, bawal yan. Stop doing that. So it's, it's called authoritarian because the control is on the parent's side and there's no control on the child's side. And this can be very limiting for a child because the attachment is only one-sided. In fact, 
the attachment here can be very uh, scary for a child. A child can grow up being very fearful that the parent can be very punishing towards the child. So, um, you know, lalaki ang bata na takot, takot sa galit ng magulang. And the child cannot even develop their, their self-confidence, their competency. They're not able to also be independent or autonomous because they fear that the parents will be criti critical of them or will be very controlling of the child. So as young as even toddlers, let's allow children to have some sense of power or some sense of control in the very little things. Of course, wag naman yung hayaan natin yung bata na umakit ng hagdan na mag-isa. But it can be in the little choices, simple choices of um, are they going to choose the blue or are they going to choose the green crayon? As simple as those things, we're allowing the child to have some sense of empowerment in their choices. And in the last parenting style, we have the authoritative. The authoritative parenting is described as very responsive to the needs of the child, but at the same time also, there is a degree of control. The control here is two-way, that the parent imposes some form of control, but we also give the child some level of control. And um, it is very supportive to the development of the child, the needs of the child, and it's very inclusive of all the, the dimensions of a child. And this is where um, we convey the message na, anak, nandito lang si mama. O sige lang, andito si mama na sa tabi mo, tingnan natin, kaya mo ba to? So these are what we will hear as typical verbals of parenting styles that is more authoritative. And so at this point, I want to emphasize that even in quarantine, we have to encourage children the value of play. And when we say play here, we don't mean that um, it, this is gadgets or screen time, but this is the kind of play where children are allowed to play with their toys. And it can be art materials, it can be blocks, it can be as, even scissors. Children can, be, can, can have the freedom to use scissors as long as they are not um, yung, yung sharp, ang edge, na, yung pointed. Um, but something that allows them to have a good grip on the scissors and under the proper guidance of um, their parents. Because play is the natural expression of children as they interact with the world. When children are able to play, it allows them to accommodate the world instead of just always assimilating and, um, or accommodating na one way lang. Because Play allows for both the assimilation and the accommodation. It's uh, a child able to externalize what they know and then from, from adjusting and adapting their schema, they're able to internalize now new knowledge. Through play, they're able to trust the adult or their caregiver in the spirit of the exchange of play. It forms a secure attachment in the young toddler, and it encourages in independence and autonomy of the child towards their developing sense of self. And so in the title of my talk, I wanted to talk about um, how do we encourage children to flourish in this time? And so I coined the term save because I wanted to share with you what is it that we can do to help children to flourish and the first uh, letter for the SAFE principle is for S. And S means to sense your child. To sense your child is to, to be able to have a feel of our children. To sense their verbals and their nonverbals. If you are very uh, sharp with the way that you observe your children, you might even observe some changes in their appetite, some changes in the way they play, which can also alert you that there must be something that the child is not able to express and maybe it's already not healthy. So as parents, you are the best people to sense your children about their behavior that you observe, um, 
their the quality of their sleep, the food that they're able to take in. Um, are are they still writing at par? Are they able to color? Are they um, are they learning at par? And um, you know, are they also able to develop their language? Are they able to adequately play? So, as parents, we need to sense our children. The next letter is A. It is to be an ally of our children. There's nobody that is the most perfect person to be protecting our children's um, welfare but the parents. In the absence of parents, we can have the lolo, the lola. We can also have siblings. Um, but the family is the basic unit of the child and we need to be able to convey to the child that we are their ally whether you are parenting your adolescent or your your middle age uh, childhood na child at all costs we have to be able to convey that we are their ally we are there to support them we understand them and if communications break down we have to have that space to invite the children for that conversation. Um, open that conversation and say, and tell the children, can you tell me, can you tell mama what I need to know so that I, so that I can best understand you? So conversations like that can help with their social, emotional, and psychological development. The next letter is V. And V means to validate their feelings, their thoughts, and experiences. To validate means let us reflect what the children are saying and maybe what they're not saying as well. Let us reflect it back so that we open the dialogue and the conversations so that we can be an ally to the children. To validate means to just accept and to acknowledge. It may not mean that you agree with your children, but it is the basic step to acknowledge. Otherwise, your children will always have to be defensive. So validate their feelings. And the last, it is to empower the capacity of our children. Find what they're good at, not just what they are, what they're not good at, what they are wrong or what, what we tend to criticize our children. You know, ganun talaga yung, yung parenting, no? we're so quick to criticize our children. We tend to compare our children with their cousins. But, you know, when we criticize, when we compare, these are really uh, the, the, the deal breaker because it will, it will break the child's spirit. But on the other hand, when we validate, when we, uh, when we show our children that we are their allies, and most importantly, when we empower the child, then we're able to build on their confidence and their competencies. So let's empower the capacity of the child, what they are good at. Even if it's as simple as coloring and they, they color beyond the lines of the picture, we can still commend the child for coloring. Never mind kung may konting lampas. The point is the child was able to color. And so from there, this is how we can teach our children how they can flourish, it is through the same principle. Let us sense our children. Let us be their ally. Let us validate their feelings and we can empower the children. So I'd like to close with today's um, short quote that I picked up. There are no perfect parents and there are no perfect children, but there are plenty of perfect moments along the way. And so even in quarantine, it is still a good enough moment so that we can build on our children and their capacity, their confidence. We can work on our parenting styles so that we can encourage them. We can also be mindful of a holistic development of our children, being mindful of their developmental needs. All right? So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Riza. Uh, you have been able to teach us the same principle and the value of play, taking into consideration our social, emotional, and psychological aspects of a child. Now, we have one question for you. Um, given that we are still in quarantine, how can parents 
allow children to play without using gadgets. Can you please share with us some simple activities that we can do at home? Thank you for that question. And uh, I think it's really a challenge for parents. How is it that we can encourage our young children to play in, um, in our very small place in the house? And so your question is, how is it that we can um, encourage play? And I think, you know, when you look around the house, you can um, find very concrete ways for children to play. Example, like you can put up manila paper on one side of the wall. And you can have children use their crayons and to draw from that part of the wall. And siguro, we just have to encourage children na, okay, anak, dito lang tayo sa papel, magdo-drawing. Hindi tayo magdo-drawing dito sa pader. Okay, na, itong papel ng ito, ha, manila paper. So when um, you put those limits, uh, that is already a fantastic way of how we can contribute to the physical, the social, and the cognitive development of the children because we allow them to have the space to draw, to have a good grip of a crayons, and then, you know, just moving their arms around and they're able to see that they can create lines. They can um, put a heavy uh, marks that can, can create bolder and darker colors. They might notice that when their hands move swiftly, the lines also become light and they see co cause and effect here. Um, another way that you can do this is you can give children some simple kitchen um, equipment that you can spare, like measuring cups and allow children to, to play with water. Like what happens when a big measuring cup goes to, uh, and, and that is poured into a small measuring cup? What happens when it's a small measuring cup that is poured into a big measuring cup? And just give children a, a baking pan, measuring cups and spoon, and let them play with water. Um, maybe also things in the house, like kung meron kayong mga iba't ibang mga shapes ng towel, they can practice folding. These are different ways of children to play. Um, so pwede sa wall, kitchen, bedroom, give them different colors of um, art paper and then just let them let them just crumple paper. So crumpling allows them to work with their fine motor, to have uh, um, eye-hand coordination because what they crumple, they see that the properties of paper changes. So those are examples of how we can still practice play even if children are confined in small spaces. Thank you very much, Ms. Riza. And again, after discussing pregnancy in the newborn, infant, and toddler, let's move on to the next stage, which is early childhood. Our next speaker is Dr. Ermenilda Avendano, who is a child neurologist and a neurodevelopmental pediatrician. She is a fellow four times over with the Philippine Pediatric Society, Philippine Neuro Neurological Association, Child Neurology Society of the Philippines, and currently the president of the Philippine Society for Developmental and Behavioral Pediatrics. She completed her Doctor of Medicine at the UST Faculty of Medicine and Surgery, which in incidentally just celebrated their sesquicentennial or 150 years, completed her postgraduate internship in the same institution, residency in pediatrics at Children's Medical Center, fellowship in child neurology at the Philippine Children's Medical Center, where she also completed her fellowship in neurodevelopmental pediatrics and went for a visiting fellowship in child neurology and neurodevelopmental pediatrics at New Common Center Guys Hospital in London. Currently, she is the chief of the Division of Child Neuroscience of Philippine Children's Medical Center, the head of the section of Neurodevelopmental Pediatrics at PCMC, and a consultant in child neurology and neurodevelopmental pediatrics at the same center. Let's all give a warm virtual welcome to Dr. Erminilda Avendano on her lecture, Keeping Our Children Safe Physically and Mentally during this pandemic and beyond. Good afternoon. 
I'm Dr. Daniel, and I'm here to talk about the mental health of the early childhood years, specifically the preschool child from three to five years of age. I would want to share with you how we can keep our children safe physically and mentally during the COVID-19 pandemic and even beyond. So at the end of the session, we have to understand the characteristics of the preschool age group, realize how they can be affected by the pandemic, be aware of the red flags of mental health concerns, and of course, the most important part is to empower families on how to help them not just cope, but even to flourish. So we know that the early childhood years, their characteristics are these children are active and explore new forms of play and environment. They often ask questions. They're very inquisitive. They often ask questions to understand the world around them. And a lot of times they can often explain themselves well or tell us about their worries. They have little life experience of outside world yet, but they are lay learning the basic of social well-being from parents and even from the siblings and they're starting to build uh, outside relationships so a well balanced child would have good mental health and how do you recognize this this uh, in the early years they would feel happy and positive about themselves most of the time they are kind to themselves when things don't go the way they expected they can learn well they get along well with family and friends they can manage being sad, being worried or angry, having all those feelings. They can bounce back from tough times. They are prepared to try new and challenging things. So they're very adaptable and they are able to look into things that they may not be able to do and yet thrive on this and make this uh, challenging for them. And of course, they eventually cope and succeed. So what has happened? For the things that are happening for the past 14 months now, there's that COVID-19 pandemic. And they say that the coronavirus is the virus that has changed the world. But I think it's not just changed the world. It has changed every one of us. It has changed not only adults, not only adolescents, but even young children. And it is because of a lot of things that have happened. We have experienced from the COVID-19 pandemic, um, transgressions in terms of physical health, the economy has plunged, family stability, job security, a lot of losses in terms of jobs, bankruptcy for the families, social relationships, family stability, learning has also been affected, and even social, emotional, and mental health. All of this has affected the adults, not only the adults, but even the young children. And if the young children, like here in the preschool age group, see how much their families are stressed, then they too are affected. So what would be the challenges that preschoolers face nowadays? Number one is the change in routines. There are certain routines that the preschoolers are already used to, but because of this COVID-19 pandemic, which is something that we did not prepare for, then a lot of abrupt changes have occurred. And this may be causing some concerns in terms of the regularity of things. Yung initial, masaya pa yung mga bata because there are no schools, there are no rules in the house, uh, there are there are already no rules in the house because they can sleep anytime they want, but eventually they tend to understand it's getting to be long. And these routines are not so good after all. There's also a break in continuity of care and learning. As Filipinos, we have the extended family to take care of the young kids. Diba? Aside from the parents who are working, Sanay na sanay na may mga lolos and lolas, may mga yaya, even aunts and uncles. But abruptly, things have changed and hindi na makapunta tong mga loved ones. Uh, those who love the small kids dearly. It's because of the physical distancing. Some of these uh, grandparents or even adults may have been sick. That's why they're not there. And it has changed a lot of things. And children are looking for this, um, this trusted caregivers. And there's also a change or a break in terms of learning for those who are already attending preschools. Suddenly, there's no teacher or suddenly there's no playmate. It's now online. And some of these children don't understand initially, why, is my, why do I have to just face my 
teacher um, in the computer, why can't I be going to school and uh, talk to my teacher and talk to my friends? So that's another issue that uh, these children are confronting. There's also a break in continuity of health care. So here in the Philippines, there's been an abrupt halt in terms of consultations and even immunization. And this may be causing some uh, stress in the part of the children. And of course, the illnesses, missed, missed immunizations may be threatening our children's health too. There also is missed significant life events, sanay na sanay to attend birthdays and even to celebrate their own birthdays, to have graduations, to have Christmas celebrations and other family gatherings with relatives. This is the Pinoy way of life. And then suddenly, there's none at all. Sometimes also having to attend funerals is a very important facet in the lives of uh, Filipinos. But with this COVID pandemic, everything has been put to halt because of safety reasons. And number five, there's loss of security and safety. Because of the economic plunge, a lot of families have lost, uh, parents have lost their jobs. And if there's loss of job and there's family instability, there may be a lot of uh, crisis, financial crisis, and certain things may not be available to the family anymore. And with all the situation that is occurring, that the parents may become so irritable, may become so worried, and there may be physical violence that can be happening at home, not just physical, even verbal. And in unfortunate cases, there can be sexual violence. So all of these things put together, or if not mitigated, can cause a very high toll in a child's well-being. And this is their stress. And if there is stress, then it's not uh, healthy for these children. But what I would also want to emphasize is that Children are very perceptive and will always mirror the stress of the parents. Nanggagaling sa parents, nakikita nila. And that's how they become more stressed also. Sometimes they don't understand such situations, but they see their parents uh, facing all these challenges and that makes them stress as well. What we would want is for this stress to be mitigated, to be controlled, to may be made into a positive stress or a learning stress. And that is because of the presence of nurturing relationships or a supportive environment. But if the stressors become prolonged, if it is, if it is not um, uh, answered, then these stresses become what is known as toxic stress. So the absence of loving relationships, the difficulties of... Uh, trying to curtail all of these stressors would make you up into a toxic stress. And this is what we would know or we would define as the adverse childhood experiences. So having said that, sometimes children don't really understand what is going on or what they feel. They cannot express it properly, unlike the older children. Then how would we understand or how would we realize, how would we know that a child, especially the preschooler, is under stress. So we have to recognize the signs of stress in these young children. And it may they may not be able to say it, but they can certainly show it. And we as adults, especially the parents and all those inside the house, would have to watch out for this. And it can be changes in eating habits, changes in sleeping habits, dati masarap matulog, and then suddenly disturbed or having nightmares. Yung eating, some, dati okay kumain, tapos hindi nakakakain, konti lang. They have difficulty concentrating. A child suddenly becomes restless, irritable, and clingy. So nakikita, bakit nagkaiiba ang behaviors nila? So this would be returning behave to behaviors that they have actually at grow. Diba dati, may tantrum siya, pero uh, nagmamature siya, so nawawala because the child is self-regulated already. But when they go back to such things, then it's time to look into the probable causes. There can also be psychosomatic symptoms. They have uh, headache, complaints of headache, body pain, etc. And when they consult the pediatrician, wala naman makita. So best to observe, but really look into what would be the possible stressors that can uh, manifest with complaints of uh, physiological complaints. And then if they're uh, getting 
attending school, poor school performance, and of course, in the house, avoidance of activities that they had enjoyed in the past. And now they're not um, enjoying or they're not looking for uh, this at all. So recognizing those uh, would be important so that we will, as adults, we would be able to make sure that we can address this as early as possible. So what can we do to prevent this? We have to talk, to listen, and encourage expression. Talk truthfully to your children at age-appropriate levels or sometimes developmentally appropriate levels. It's very difficult to lie that everything is okay, walang problema. Sometimes you can explain it in the way they would be able to understand it. And that is important for the children because your children would really trust you. Number two, you have to listen to what they are saying. And as we had said earlier, ano ba yung signs and symptoms? You have to look if they are unable to express what they feel and what they are um, thinking about or what they are feeling. Then sometimes you really have to look into the way they're acting and the way they're behaving. But best of all is also to encourage them to tell something. If they, uh, what they feel, encourage them to express themselves in any manner. Number two is providing the three R's, and that is reassurance, routines, and regulations with trusted caregivers. Routines or whatever is uh, being done pre-pandemic, you have to continue it because life really goes on. There are certain challenges or limitations, but it's something that we have to do on a regular basis. We need to reassure them that uh, things are going on the way uh, we would want it to be in the best way that we are doing it. Routines in terms of uh, meal times, in terms of waking up in the morning, helping out parents are very nice things to do. Regulations, um, discipline rules are very important also. Not because it's pandemic or lockdown, there are no rules anymore in terms of gadget, no rules anymore in terms of what to eat and when to eat, etc. So these are rules these uh, three R's are very important to us. Number three is to continue learning and play. And the play. So learning can happen not just inside the classroom or not just through online classes, but learning happens actually every day in every situation that the family is encountering, that the child is having, especially with a perceptive and supportive adult. That is the chance that the child will be able to learn most. It's the person-to-person -person interactions that the child will be able to learn. And it is through the experiences that these children are having on a day-to-day -day basis. Play is a powerful example of uh, being able to optimally learn. Because when you play, there are a lot of developmental things, uh, aspects that are into play. For example, motor. We also have fine motor if you hold things. You have language, being able to express what you want and being able to understand what the other person is talking about, what are the rules of the game, uh, interaction, face-to-face, uh, -face, uh, give-and-take relationships, etc., waiting for your turn. So you see that play can teach us a lot of things. And the child even enjoys that, especially when with another person even with the parent. Next is about teaching simple ways to be healthy. We know and we want to emphasize that the pillars of health would be nutrition, physical activity, and of course, sleep. So we have to make sure all of these three are in the optimal level for these children, make them move around, make them exert physical activity, even by helping you out in terms in the chores, that is physical activity that keeps them going. Number two is in terms of nutrition. It's not just serving uh, nourishing food or uh, nutritionally adequate food. It's also the relationship that uh, you have and maintain when eating together. Okay, And of course, sleep. Having adequate sleep, enough sleep, and a good quality of sleep is important. Number five is to be creative in ways to celebrate life events. These children look forward to birthdays, look forward to visits to grandparents, and sometimes even vacation. So we have to be creative in celebrating life events. So sometimes online network. In, in a lot of times, naman, diba, 
you have a small cake and you celebrate it, say, sing happy birthday. That's what's happening. But of course, sometimes you sort of semblance of a birthday party. That's where you invite uh, classmates and friends online. And then there's graduation. Diba? Nakailan graduation na batwa? Dalawa na. Uh, last year and of course this year. So you see how schools are also adapting and trying to make sure that the graduates are given due uh, recognition. Number six is to practice physical distancing because that is important in, the, in order to curtail disease. But not social distancing and never social isolation. So you may be physically distant from your friends, from your relatives, but there are ways to maintain social relationships. There are maintains to remove the idea of isolation. And this is the time we're so thankful for technology, for bringing people together, for keeping our sanity so that we can be able to communicate with another person, even if they are not at home. So that's a very important aspect too. So my mental health toolkit that I would want you to have in terms of helping keep children safe during the pandemic and beyond can be put into three main categories. I've explained six, but let me put it into three. Number one, you want to ensure a healthy lifestyle. So as I had said, what are the pillars of health? It's nutrition, it's physical activity, and sleep. Number two, if you are having routines, if you have good uh, interactions with family members, there's learning and there's good play, then you create a stress-reduced environment because these children are able to enjoy life even within the confines of their home, even with limited resources. So you have to keep them grounded. It's not because they can't get out, they won't be able to enjoy you have to let them understand there are lots of things that you can do at home and you can enjoy, especially with family members. And number three, have nurturing relationships. These relationships are important for the child to foster good attachments, for the child to have social relationships. And you know also, it's something that's very important to make sure that there is a strong brain architecture that is growing inside the child's head. It should be responsive, it should be supportive, and it should be safe. So my take-home message for parents is that you remember that you can make your home a place for opportunities. Number two, there is much to be gained from interactions with parents, with siblings, and even with pets. Number three, Create opportunities for children to adapt through loving and, of course, supporting relationships to help them prepare for challenges and for the changes and then eventually come out resilient. And number four, and I think that is, this is very important, to take care of yourself. So this is my take-home message for you, and I hope this has been somehow helpful for a lot of parents and for the others in the audience who are listening. So these are my references. And I'd like to thank you very much for your kind attention. That was really an enlightening lecture, short and sweet and easy to remember. If we had the same principle earlier, you showed us now the HSN, healthy lifestyle, stress reducing and nurturing relationships. I have a question for you. Um, what difficulties might a parent encounter in determining whether a child is stressed or not? Um, unlike older children, preschoolers still cannot explain properly or even tell us what is bothering them or what is worrying them. So in fact, sometimes they don't even understand pa what they are feeling and perhaps why they are feeling that way. So young children don't have the ability and to understand the world like other older children and even adults. So these changes in routines uh, in people around them can easily make young children worried or anxious, even though they often cannot explain this. So what 
young children would need the most is a sense of safety and security from parents, which they can feel from caregivers when they hold them, when they talk to them, when they reassure them, and if these caregivers stay calm with them and listen to them. I think that's uh, the most important thing to, for the preschoolers. Thank you very much, Mimi. And now we're two, two hours into our event, and we would like to pause for another intermission number by, again, our very dear friend, Martin Nivera, who is a Filipino-American singer and television host. His career spanning more than three decades, I think uh, we all grew up together with him. He has garnered 18 platinum, five double platinum, three triple platinum, and one quadruple platinum albums. And I'm not going to He is often referred to, as mentioned earlier, the concert king. And also, he said, the grief king. So let's give a warm welcome again to Martin Nievera for his song, Ikaw.
Thank you very much, Martin, for that wonderful rendition of Ikao. Now, our third lecture for the school age child, so this is from age 7 to 12, will be given by Dr. Rodora Andrea Concepcion, a child psychiatrist. She's a life fellow of the Philippine Psychiatric Association and a diplomat of the Philippine Board of Psychiatry and is the fellow and president of the Philippine Society of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry. She completed her residency training in general psychiatry at the UPPGH and completed a post-residency fellowship in child and adolescent psychiatry at the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Medicine, Section of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry at UP. PGH and was chief fellow at UPPGH. Currently, she is a consultant psychiatrist at the Lung Center of the Philippines, a visiting consultant at the Philippine Heart Center for Asia, and a consultant psychiatrist at the Angeles University Foundation Medical Center and Angeles City Sacred Heart Medical Center. Let's give a warm virtual welcome to Dr. Rodora Andrea Concepcion. Good day to everyone and a pleasant day to all my fellow speakers. I'm Dr. Rodora Andrea Concepcion. I would like to thank the APCAM, Adult Leukemia Foundation of the Philippines, in cooperation with the Philippine College of Physicians and the Philippine Pediatric Society for the opportunity to be invited as speaker in this webinar. As we continue our discussion in addressing the pandemic woes at every stage across the lifespan, let us focus this time on the school-aged child, children 7 to 12 years old. In this lecture, we will try to peek into the minds of these children and maybe try to look into the depths of their thoughts as a generation growing and surviving this pandemic. A pandemic through the eyes of a child. These are the objectives of this webinar, and for my particular topic, we will go through each objective as we proceed with the discussion. While COVID-19 is typically benign in children, the pandemic could have long-lasting impacts on society's youngest members. Child care programs are either closed or limited and social distancing measures in place, many children are missing out on opportunities for development. Children are not getting the cognitive and social stimulation that they would normally be getting outside their home. For society's youngest members, the effects of the pandemic go beyond the disease itself. Socializing plays an important role in their development, from learning to share to honing their language skills. But in social distancing measures in place, many children are missing out on opportunities to play. A delay in social skills may not be the only consequence of the pandemic. Many parents undergo financial stress. Children face higher rates of housing and food insecurity and others are subject to rising rates of neglect and household dysfunction, all of which can affect a child's trajectory into adulthood. And so we ask, how does social isolation affect a child's mental health and development? Creating social relationships is central to human well-being, and engaging in social interaction is vital during childhood development. These school-age children are lacking from those social interactions that they would have normally gotten from people outside their lives. They are lacking that play time with other children. The absence of social relationships and behaviors have been shown to affect the development in various ways. For example, previous research has revealed that socially isolated children tend to have lower subsequent educational attainment, be part of a less advantaged social class in adulthood, 
more likely to be psychologically distressed in adulthood and is closely related to loneliness and physiological illness affecting the healthy development of the brain. Aside from social isolation, COVID-19 has caused widespread school closures. Children across the country are being given al alternate resources, some online, to study outside of the classroom. Temporary solutions being devised for remote education range from online classroom using virtual platform, platforms like Zoom and Google Classroom. While parents are adjusting to this new scenario, during this time, it's also important to help these children make proper use of screen time by staying focused on learning and avoiding overuse of games, social media, and videos. This is a stressful time for parents and children. Parents can help their children by providing them with a structure and routine and being a positive force in their education. The Children and Screens Institute of Digital Media and Child Development has put together 10 tips for families as they adjust to the new reality of learning at home. Here are the 10 tips for parents in navigating the new realities of online education. Digital quarantine. Consider limiting your children's cell phones and tablets until their schoolwork is done satisfactorily so that it can receive their undivided attention. Apps, games, and messaging messages are fun, but they can also prove to be distracting. It may not be an option for everybody, but ideally, try to give your kids a dedicated device such as a school laptop for maximum online learning. Make space for learning. Children will achieve their best work in a quiet, comfortable space devoted to learning. This should be a different setup when they're where they normally play games or watch television. It's important to keep in mind that children will be in this space for many hours each day and parents should watch out for any orthopedic issues that may arise related to comfort and posture. Third is monitor the computer monitor. The simplest way to do this is observation. Look at your child's eyes to see if they're following along with the screen. Check if they are taking notes or zoning out. Ask questions at the end of the lesson to confirm that your children are indeed learning. Sometimes easily remedied technological or technical problems such as bad audio, poor connection, or an unhelpful camera angle can make all the difference. Digital recess. Make sure that your children take plenty of breaks in order to get physical activity and time away from screens. Set alarms similar to those they would encounter at school and encourage them to get up. Get some fresh air, go for a walk or have a snack so that they are not sedentary for the entire day. FaceTime. In-person interaction is ideal for kids. But until it's safe for them to return to school, encourage your children to video chat or text message rather than simply scrolling through social media. You don't want your children to feel socially isolated, but at the same time, you want to protect them from becoming wholly reliant upon their devices. Sit your children down for face-to-face -face conversations about screen time. Discuss how much time they think is reasonable to spend online. And make a contract committing to goals for on-screen versus off-screen hours. Keep it old school. Overuse of screen time can have adverse impacts on young brains. As much as possible, parents should encourage print and book reading. If available, request textbooks from your child's school along with other print materials to offset the amount of online learning they will be doing. Studies show that remote education can be challenging for all ages, especially young kids. 
stimulate self-expression by having discussions with your children about what they are doing, and also encourage creative writing and imaginative storytelling. We're all in this together. Remember that you're not alone in, in this journey. Check in with other parents to see what you've found effective or to ask if they need help. Share your concerns and useful hints. It is important that we all work together as a community for the good of our children and families. Plan your work and work your plan. Good planning can relieve stress for both children and parents. Check in with your kids about their plans and help them develop a written schedule, not only for the day, but for the week as a whole. Help them prioritize and learn to create goals, tasks, and deadlines, just like adults do when they go to work. Tasks that may not have been difficult for them while attending school in person can become more challenging when learning from home. So it's important to reinforce boundaries and other incentives for healthy behaviors. To avoid disruption, some after-school activities may be offered via online video apps. This ain't no vacation. Even though staying home from school might feel like a holiday, remind your kids that they are not on vacation. Assignments, grades, requirements, and tests are not going away just because classes have moved online. Don't forget to have fun. Plan off-screen activities for the whole family. Between school and work obligations, it's rare for parents and children to have this much time together. So turn it into an opportunity for bonding. Follow your community's guidelines about safe behavior and events, of course, but make sure you still find time for fun with your kids. Without a doubt, this is a challenging time for parents, teachers, and children alike. Studies show that screen time can have both positive and adverse impacts on kids, and the shift to online education will only increase your child's time with their devices. Coronavirus COVID-19 can affect children and young people directly and indirectly. Apart from social isolation and the shift from social face-to-face -to, -face to digital online homeschooling, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, or CDC, developed this COVID-19 parental resource kit, ensuring children and young people's social, emotional, and mental well-being to help support parents, caregivers, and other adults serving children and young people in recognizing children and young people's social, emotional, and mental health challenges and helping to secure or and helping to ensure their well-being. In the next slides, we will learn about the social, emotional, and mental health challenges faced by each group. On my part, the childhood or the school-aged period, and find out what you can do to help and access age group-specific resources to get you started. The other challenges children face during the COVID-19 pandemic relate to changes in their routines, like having to physically distance from family, friends, and worship community. In addition to other everyday steps to prevent COVID-19, physical or social distancing is one of the best tools we have to avoid being exposed to this virus and to slow its spread. However, it can be hard for children. It is important for adults to support children in taking time to check in with friends and family to see how they are doing. Breaks in continuity of learning. Examples are virtual learning environments, technology access, and connectivity issues. Participating in school from home is one way to help stop the spread of COVID-19. Online platforms and learning communities have become essential as children and their families turn to digital solutions more than ever to support children's learning. 
Unfortunately, the immediate need to have virtual school and learning revealed inequity in resources, access, and connectivity across students and communities. It is important for parents to reach out to teachers, school administrators to discuss the challenges your family may face supporting virtual learning and to discuss options that may be available through the school. Break in continuity of health. Examples are missed child or missed well child and immunization visits, limited access to mental, speech, and occupational health services. Parents may have avoided seeking health care due to stay-at-home orders and may continue to do so because they are afraid of getting sick with COVID-19. This includes important well-child visits, immunizations, and oral health care. Additionally, school closures have impacted many children's ability to receive mental health and speech therapy services. It is important to ensure children receive continuity of health care when it becomes available. Missed significant life events. Examples are grief of missing celebrations, vacation plans, and milestone life events. Birthdays, graduations, shows, vacations, and even funerals are just a sample of the many significant life events that children may have missed experiencing during COVID-19. Social isolation and physical distancing affected the ability of friends and family to come together in person to celebrate or, or grieve in typical ways. Grief is a normal response to losing someone or something important to you. It is important to help children understand that hosting gatherings during COVID-19 could be dangerous to, to those who would want to participate. Family and friends can help them find alternate ways to connect and support each other at a distance. Lost security and safety. Examples are housing and food insecurity, increased exposure to violence and online harms, threat of physical illness, and uncertainty for the future. The household income of many families with children was affected due to job loss and waste and lost wages. Economic insecurity is consistently linked to children's adverse development academic achievement, and health outcomes. It may affect their ability to consistently access healthy food, safe transportation, and housing. Some children may have been increasingly exposed to child abuse and neglect, online harms, and domestic violence. It is important for parents and caregivers to maintain a trustworthy relationship and open communication with children, watching for behavioral changes that may signal distress. So what can you do? Here are some steps to help provide stability and support to children. It is very important to remember that children look to adults for guidance on how to react to stressful situations. This is also a very good opportunity for adults to model for children problem-solving flexibility, and compassion as we work through adjusting daily schedules, balancing work and activities, getting creative about how we spend time, processing new information, connecting with family and friends in new ways. Stay calm, listen, and offer assurance. Be a role, be a role model. Children will react to and follow your reactions. They learn from your example. Be aware of how you talk about COVID-19. Your discussion about COVID-19 can increase or decrease your child's fear. Respond your, to your thoughts and respond to their thoughts and feelings with truth and reassurance. Explain social distancing. Demonstrate deep breathing. Deep breathing is a valuable tool for calming the nervous system. Do breathing exercises with your children. Focus on the positive. Celebrate having more time to spend as a family. Make it as fun as possible. 
do and organize family projects. Establish and maintain a daily routine. Keeping a regular schedule provides a sense of control, predictability, calm, and well-being. It also helps children and other family members respect others' need for quiet or uninterrupted time and when they can connect with friends virtually. Identify projects that help others. This could include writing letters to the neighbors or others who might be stuck at home alone or to healthcare workers or reading a favorite children's book on a social media platform for younger children to hear and offer lots of love and affection. Monitor television viewing and social media. Parents and guardians should monitor television, internet, and social media viewing, both for themselves and for their children. Watching continual updates on COVID-19 may increase fear and anxiety. Developmentally inappropriate information or information designed for adults can also cause anxiety or confusion, particularly in young children. Dispel rumors and inaccurate Information, provide alternatives, and engage your children in games or other exciting activities. Time to talk. Let your children's questions guide you. Answer their questions truthfully, but don't offer unnecessary details or facts. A sense of control will reduce their fears. Be honest and accurate. Correct misinformation. Children often imagine situations worse than reality. Therefore, offering developmentally appropriate facts can reduce fears. Explain simple safety steps. Stay up to date on the facts. Keep explanations age appropriate. For all children, encourage them to verbalize their thoughts and feelings. And it's very important for you to be a good listener. Stay connected to school. Locate learning resources. Schools' capacity to conduct virtual learning experiences will vary greatly, but most schools are providing lessons and learning activities for children to do. Know the symptoms of COVID-19. Model basic hygiene and healthy lifestyle practices. Practice daily good hygiene. Encourage your child to practice these simple steps to prevent spreading the virus. Wash your hands multiple times a day for 20 seconds. Compliment your children when they do it the right way. Foster a sense of control. Offering guidance on what your child or children can do to prevent infection offers them a greater sense of control, which reduces anxiety. Build the immune system. Encourage your child to eat a balanced diet, get enough sleep, and exercise regularly. This will help them develop a strong immune system to fight off illness. Be aware of your children's mental health. Most children will manage well with the support of parents and other family members. Some children, however, may have risk factors for more intense reactions. Parents and caregivers should contact a professional if children exhibit significant changes in their behavior. Parental Toolkit Creative Activities for School-Age Children For the school-age group, part of the Parental Toolkit are creative activities to encourage COVID-19 prevention practices and socio-emotional well-being. Postcard reminders. These are some examples of postcard reminders. Parents can print, children can write a note and send to a loved one. Parents and children can also make their own out of index cards. And these resources may be useful for children 6 to 12 years old. These are some more postcard reminders. These are also activity books on learning about COVID-19 that are useful for this age group. These are the other exercises in the activity book. 
and some more exercise activities. Board games for children. Parents can play this board game with their kids to learn tips for a healthy school year. This resource may be useful for, for children ages 6 to 12 years old. Parents, caregivers, and other trusted adults can serve as sources of social connectedness. They can also help children and young people express the many different feelings and thoughts on their mind. Here are some quick ideas for how to get conversations started with children and youth about how they are feeling and what they are struggling with regarding COVID-19. You don't have to use these exact words. You know best how to speak with your child, adolescent, or youth. In addition, um, how we talk to children and youth varies depending on their age and developmental level. What worries you about COVID-19? Have you been feeling nervous about going back to school because of COVID-19? So these are some of the conversation starters that you may use for that may be helpful for these children. Other creative activity ideas. It will be useful and helpful to get creative with these kids. Here are some few ideas on how to have fun while learning how to protect ourselves and others from COVID-19. These resources may be useful for children and adolescents. Do-it-yourself masks. Wearing a mask is a very important step that we can take to stop the spread of COVID-19. Make it a family project to create masks. Be creative and stylish. Do-it-yourself soap. Hand washing is an easy and effective way to prevent the spread of COVID-19 and other germs and keep kids and adults healthy. You can help your kids make their own soap. The hand washing song. Hand washing can become a lifelong healthy habit if you start teaching it at an early age. Teach kids the steps for proper hand washing and the key times to wash hands, such as after using the bathroom or before eating. You can make it more fun. You can make up your own hand washing song and sing it for 20 seconds to help teach the length of time to wash your hands. Now, dealing with the loss of a loved one is always painful and distressing. Losing someone during the coronavirus pandemic, whether to COVID-19 or to other causes, will bring additional challenges. Here, we look at how to help the child cope with the loss of a loved one. When a loved one dies, children feel and show their grief in different ways. How kids cope with the loss depends on things like their age, how close they felt to the person who died, and the support that they received. Here are some things parents can do to help a child who has lost a loved one. When talking about death, use simple, clear words. To break the news that someone has died, approach your child in a caring way. Pause to give your child a moment to take in your words. Listen and comfort. Every child reacts differently to learning that a loved one has died. Some cry, some ask questions, others seem to not react at all. That's okay. Stay with your child to offer hugs and reassurance. Answer your child's questions or just be together for a few minutes. Put emotions into words. Encourage kids to say what they're thinking and feeling in the days, weeks, and months following the loss. Talk about your own feelings too. It helps kids be aware of and feel comfortable with theirs. Say things like, I know you're feeling very sad and I am sad too. We both love grandma so much and she loved us too. Tell your child what to expect. If the death of a loved one means changes in your child's life, head off any worries or fears by explaining what will happen. For example, Aunt Sarah will pick you up from school like Grandma used to. 
Talk about funerals and rituals. Allow children to join in rituals like viewings, funerals, or memorial services. Tell your child ahead of time what will happen. For example, lots of people who love grandma will be there. We will sing, we will pray, and people will talk about grandma's life. People might cry and hug each other, and they would offer and say my condolences. You can stay near me and hold my hand if you want. Give your child a role. Having a small active role can help kids master an unfamiliar emotional situation, such as a funeral or a memorial service. For example, you might invite your child to read a poetry piece, pick a song to be played, gather some photos to display, or make something that kids decide if they want to take part and how. Help your child remember the person. In the days and weeks ahead, encourage your child to draw pictures or write down favorite stories of their loved one. Don't avoid mentioning the person who died. Recalling and sharing happy memories help heal grief and activate positive feelings. Respond to emotions with comfort and reassurance. Ask about feelings and listen. Let your child know that it takes time to feel better after a loved one dies. Help your child feel better. Provide the comfort your child needs, but don't dwell on the sad feelings. After a few minutes of talking and listening, shift to an activity or topic that helps your child feel a little better. Play, make art together, cook, or go somewhere together. Give your child time to heal from the loss. Grief about the loved one, it means remembering the person with love and letting loving memories bring good feelings that support us as we go on to enjoy life. Be a sanctuary for your child. You are their sanctuary and you are their safe place. You are the person they can express how they feel and what they are thinking. Establish what or establish that expressing how they feel is okay. They may not be sad right away and that's okay. They may be mad or confused. Whatever they feel, the important thing is to tell them that it is okay. Be with your child in their grief. Know that it's okay to grieve in front of them. Tell him why. It gives him a space for his grief as well. The best thing to do is to be with them in their grief. Stay with them, hold them, and don't let them feel alone in it. Share memories. Find ways as a family to remember your loved one. Perhaps it's planting a tree, having a special picture book all about grandma, or having a special day, you remember them. Anything that connects your family and your loved one who has passed. Here are some children's books that are also helpful to explain death in concrete ways. This book explains death in simple and clear yet gentle terms. This book talks about the idea that death is a natural part of life and the kinds of feelings a child may have after they have lost someone they love. This is good for young children. This is a good book also for toddlers and other children alike. It explains death, loss, and coping in a simple and comforting way. Now, we would like to practice our faith and spirituality with our children in a meaningful way during this COVID-19 crisis. How can we discover new opportunities to do this? Our spiritual and um, faith-based practices are both individual and communal. Each of us needs to find what brings us meaning and be open to the fact that it might be something very different from what we have been done we have been doing before 
There are also many resources online to participate in communal events, to meditate on your own or with others, to study and reflect on sacred texts with your children, or to listen to religious concerts or music. And this is a great time to explore it. A few suggestions are limit the amount of time you explore. Choose wisely from the variety of resources and opportunities. Family can commit to a schedule of prayer and reflection with their children. Consider the time of day that is best for you and the amount of time you will commit to it. Will you do it alone, with others, or will you do both? If something of interest comes along, consider if you think it will be better than what you are already doing or if it is worth your time to, to add it to your day. Reaching out to others is a faith-filled and spiritual practice. A phone or a virtual call to someone who may feel isolated or tutoring or entertaining a younger sibling are some examples. Lockdown poetry from children across the world experiencing life during COVID-19. Since March 2020, the lives of billions of children have turned upside down due to the coronavirus pandemic. Today, children around the world are still out of school and experiencing the effects of remote learning, lockdown, and other new normals. To capture their experiences, Save the Children, invited children from countries around the world to write short poetry pieces about life under lockdown, sharing their hopes, fears, and how the pandemic has changed their lives. Children from Italy, Mexico, United Kingdom, Nigeria, and Republic of Congo, their lockdown poetry pieces bring to life the experiences of children living through this pandemic. Despite their differences, their struggles are shared and they remain united in their hope for a brighter future. Here are some poetry works written by school-aged children across the globe. It is so important that we listen to our children directly during these unprecedented times. We are not or we are not affected all equally, and children can be particularly vulnerable. Poetry can provide a different lens with which these children view the world as it is today. It highlights the healing power and ability of poetry for these children to reflect and to combat loneliness. Because of the COVID-19 pandemic, we can also say now that it is the perfect opportunity for school-aged children and older children to utilize poetry because, it benef because the benefits can be experienced even in solitude, which is why this is such a timely and pertinent issue today. For these children, poetry helps them feel more connected to themselves to, these, uh, to those around them, and to the external world as a whole. Poetry can also increase their self and interpersonal awareness, encourage the ownership of, of voicing your own ideas and emotions, and encourage their ability to reflect upon significant memories or current day situations. A study also shows that poetry has real emotional power and serve as a testament to all of us that we are never alone, that amongst these collective voices, we can find those that ring at the same frequency as ours. And poetry writing is a dynamic process where these children learn many new things about themselves that they did not previously think about. Writing poetry also allows them to strengthen an individual sense of identity and voice. Poetry creates avenues for self-expression, healing, and in itself, a restorative process. In conclusion, life in the time of coronavirus is full of uncertainty for children, as this is 
how the world and the future is seen through the eyes of children in this time of pandemic, helping to create a sense of normalcy and creating a sense of order at home while navigating the new and temporary normal can very much help children through the pandemic. This will offer reassurance in a very uncertain time. These children need routines that are predictable yet flexible enough to meet their individual needs. And as they take care of these children, parents and caretakers should be sure to also take care of their own physical and mental health. These are my references. Thank you for your time in listening to the lecture. Uh, that was a most extensive and enlightening lecture for the school-aged child. So now, a question for you. What are the long-term implications of experiencing a pandemic at a very young age? Since I have touched on the school-aged child, I'd like to take as an example the cognitive development and academic achievement of children. So there are studies showing that especially for children coming from low-income backgrounds, the poor access to high-quality childcare programs increases the achievement gaps that have been documented for children from higher economic backgrounds to lower-income households. And so in this time of pandemic and the parent loses job, then the child has lost access to critical resources this, that are likely to help support not only their cognitive development, but also their mastery of basic foundational academic skills, as well as key social emotional learning that we know happens in early child care programs and learning spaces. So moving beyond the pandemic, Many children, especially from the lower economic sector, have a lot of catching up to do. There is inequality in educational resources that the child's educational experience is further compromised in this situation. And so the child's cognitive, academic, social, and emotional development will continue to be compromised. Thank you very much, Dr. So let's now let's move on to the second to the last lecture. And this will be for adolescents quarantining, supporting teens during the pandemic. Our speaker is Dr. Deborah Azan Red, who completed her Doctor of Medicine at the St. Louis University in Baguio City, where I am right now, residency in pediatrics at St. Luke's Medical Center, and fellowship in adolescent medicine at the Philippine Children's Medical Center. Currently, she's the head of the section of adolescent medicine at St. Luke's Quezon City and the training officer of adolescent medicine division of PCMC and the president of SAMP. Let's give a warm virtual welcome to Dr. Debbie. Good day, everyone. Thank you very much for inviting me. It is a privilege to be a part of this uh, collaboration among EPICOM, Philippine College of Physicians, and Philippine Pediatric Society in celebration of the Mental Health Month this month of May. I am Dr. Deborah Azenred, an adolescent medicine specialist. In contribution to the mental health toolkit for the family, I was tasked to talk about adolescence. I entitled my lecture, Quarantining, Supporting Teens in Pandemic. On what to expect, I will discuss briefly the impact of COVID-19 pandemic on adolescents. Knowledge of this impact we lead to a better understanding of what they are going through. After that, I will talk on some strategies or tips to help adolescents cope. 
And lastly, I will stress on some guidelines for anyone working with adolescents. There are vital concepts to remember when we talk about adolescents. This is the period when social connections take on a different level. Adolescents develop important attachments with people other than their parents. Their peers are now becoming more important. And compared when they were younger, peer interactions this time is increasingly unsupervised by adults. The drive for autonomy can be felt as they attempt to navigate the pathway between dependence and independence. How is COVID-19 pandemic affecting the adolescents? The word pandemic is almost synonymous with the phrase social distancing and stay at home. Social distancing is something that um, somehow we adults tolerate, but it has different impact with the adolescents. We have to remember that it is in adolescents that they invest on social connections and that staying at home is somewhat a complicated thing because it is at this time when they start to separate from their parents emotionally. With that in mind, the greatest impact felt by the adolescents stems from school closure, not getting to see their friends, and yes, being in the house with family members. The impact of COVID-19 pandemic on teenagers can be captured by the phrase interrupted adolescence. And how is this? Let us start with the first thing that affected them, school closure. School is a rich source of socialization for adolescents. It is a place where they can have other leisure activities like extracurricular activities in education, like clubs and sports, hanging out with friends, and meeting new people. It is also the place where they start building relationship with the opposite sex, like flirting and dating. And all of this provide rich sources of socialization. And all of this were canceled. They also lost a lot of benchmarks that are so significant, like graduations and proms. It happened last year and it's happening again this year. Some may say these adolescents are exaggerating, or others may say you can have these things next year or succeeding years. But time moves differently to teenagers. Their perception of time is accelerated. Just to emphasize the point, a year is not a year to a 15-year-old. It is one-fifteenth of their lives and a quarter of their high school experience. Therefore, the school closure will not only have educational setback, but goes with it social and emotional setbacks as well. In adolescence, peer relationships matter almost more than family relationships because that is where they get their reality check and that is where they share their problems. This pandemic, friends, who are very important, are mostly out of reach. They are accessible mostly by social media, which we know can bring a mix of satisfying and toxic elements. And even with the most advanced technology, connecting with friends is just not the same as seeing them. And so we can say that this pandemic had stolen so much including the thing that adolescents wanted most, and that is the time with each other. And the limited interaction with peers will have an impact on their social skills and their sense of identity. Another developmental task that is glaringly affected 
is the adolescent's transition from dependence to independence. At just the age when they are biologically predisposed to seek independence from their families, adolescents have been trapped at home. So, there is interruption of the normal trajectory towards independence. Adolescents and their families are affected by the enforced proximity. Family dynamics have also changed. The stay-at-home mandates force families to spend all their time together. As a consequence, adolescents may have experienced restrictions in their personal space. While parents have faced an increase in their daily stressors, like demands of parenting, homeschooling, work from home, threats of infection, and yes, financial insecurity. What compound the problems are the struggles of online learning. The lack of devices for online class may have been addressed by now, but the poor internet connection in some areas remains a constant problem. The initial concern at the start of distance learning is navigating the unfamiliar and new kind of instructional format. After more than a year, students are now faced with virtual learning fatigue. Some adolescents feel that online learning is impersonal, isolating, and non-interactive, and that is adding to already stressful environment. It's worth mentioning that for some of the teen population, this pandemic is an unexpected blessing. They benefit from this setup. These are the introverts who crave for a long time and those who are having trouble with the physical aspect of schooling. We don't know until when we are going to have this scenario, the stay at home, the online class. So how do we help adolescents to cope? What should be included in the toolkit? Develop or maintain a structure. Helping adolescents develop a consistent schedule is important for maintaining a sense of normalcy. Teenagers who previously had a he heavily scheduled days of classes, sports practice, and social outings may find it difficult to adjust to unstructured time. A routine should help young people to feel ground and reduce anxiety to some extent. The lack of structure may enhance or amplify feelings of uncertainty teens often experience. It is important for parents to gently encourage their teens to have structure around schoolwork, household tasks, and time with friends. Parents can emphasize that this situation is difficult for them too, and they should model how to follow these guidelines themselves. When we talk about structure, we should always include having healthy sleep habits. It is not just having an adequate amount of time, but there should be regular bedtimes and wake times. Sleep timing among children and teens has drifted later this pandemic. Adolescents may be more affected than younger children because they have a biological tendency to fall asleep and wake up later. And that is what we call the sleep phase shift. There are simple things that parents can do to set some boundaries with this. Setting limits on screen time in the late evening would be a big one, as well as eliminating electronics from sleep environment because screens can disrupt sleep onset. Just like regular sleep, exercise is beneficial. It regulates mood and it provides structure. According to Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, adolescents need 60 minutes per day of exercise or physical movement. Before pandemic, 
this is doable with the physical education subject or if teens are into sports club. And for some, it is uh, being replaced by walking to and for school. But with pandemic, this has become a challenge. For adolescents, electronic platforms are effective medium to promote physical activity and exercise. Consistency and sustained motivation may be enhanced not only by family support, but especially peer support. Healthy eating habits should be prioritized as well. This includes eating a variety of food with emphasis on fruits and vegetables. Watch for the intake of fats, sugar, and salt in the form of junk foods and sugary drinks and juices. There is no doubt that being in quarantine has brought families closer together. But for adolescents who are seeking autonomy, a sense of self and privacy as part of healthy development, quarantine can be difficult. With that in mind, there should be a balance between family and alone time. It is important for parents to give their adolescents space Parents should not worry if an adolescent spends so much time in the room because a teen's room may be his or her haven. And how do you incorporate family time? Aside from having meals together, watching Netflix together, you can build closeness through everyday activities, especially household chores. Embrace technology but also unplug. Technology rules should not completely go out the window. Parents should be mindful of what platforms adolescents are using to make sure they are being safe. But it's okay to somewhat relax rules since teens now rely on technology daily and for longer periods because of the online class and in relating with their friends. It is important that families carved out unplugged times together. Adolescents are missing significant events like parties, sporting events, and milestones like proms and graduations. By now, they already have virtual celebrations. Some tips to parents, they should not force ideas on teenagers but they should be supportive in helping them explore virtual substitutes. Adolescents are very good at this. Tap into adolescents' altruistic nature. Teenagers sometimes have the reputation of being self-centered or not caring about other people. But in reality, they are often the most altruistic of any of us. Volunteering is one act that they can do. Needless to say, this brings benefits to their social emotional growth. Ideas would be online fundraising to help others, social media campaign to just raise awareness about COVID-19 infection or about mental health this pandemic. It can also be in the form of smaller acts of service that feel critical needs in the communities, like uh, contributing something to the food pantry. Anyone who works with adolescents have a critical role. Here are some guidelines. Ask, you ask them how they are doing regardless of the reason for the consultation. Listen, listen and let them know there is no right way to act or feel right now. Give. Give young people the grace to get through these challenging circumstances without having to keep up their previous level of performance. This applies especially to the online school performance because some really are not comfortable with it. Resist the fix-it urge that tries to make everything better by dismissing minimizing or replacing feelings. 
help them break up the monotony with activities or make safe connections with friends to bring them joy. Show them they are not alone by sharing some of your worries and how you manage. The stigma about mental health becomes a barrier to the health-seeking behavior. Sad thing is, stigma is coming from parents themselves, who sometimes tend to downplay the mental health issues of their adolescents. Normalize that sometimes we need outside help and a consultation with a healthcare provider or therapist is necessary. I would like to end my lecture with this quote from a Greek philosopher, Plutarch. What we achieve inwardly will change outer reality. I hope the knowledge you gain in understanding adolescents will bring change in how you relate with them this pandemic. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Debbie. And for emphasizing that social connections and dependence, independence struggle among teens they are experiencing right now. And for your uh, things in your mental health toolkit for them to ask, listen, give, resist, help, and show. Now for one question. Since the adolescents... Um, are now on online class, how can social connections, which is very important in among teens, be supported by the school, especially by the teachers? That is a very good question. The school, especially the teachers, can actually help foster social connection. And there are many ways, no? Like, they can engage their students in group projects that require them to, to reach out and collaborate. Um, schools should also establish routines and schedules uh, that provide a sense of stability. Um, in short, a structure should be maintained, as I mentioned in my lecture. Um, it is also important that they allot time for adolescents to socialize during online class in addition to doing academic work. Much, Dr. Debbie. And now for the final lecture, we know we're going a little bit, uh, what do you call this? We're going a little bit uh, later, but it's worth listening to. And we have our next speaker. Dr. Robert Buenaventura, who will now lecture on coping with the pandemic considerations in the adulthood. He is a life fellow of the Philippine Psychiatric Association, finished his Bachelor of Science, major in clinical psychology, magna cum laude at FEU, doctor of medicine at the UERMMC, residency training in general psychiatry in the same hospital, and postgraduate training in psychiatry of old age. New South Wales Institute of Psychiatry in Sydney, Australia. He is a diplomat of the Philippine Board of Psychiatry. Currently, he is a consultant psychiatrist at the UERM, head of the Department of Neurosciences at Manila Theological College, College of Medicine, former editor-in-chief of the Philippine Journal of Psychiatry, Secretary Certification Committee Specialty Board, and a treasurer and a board of director of the Philippine Psychiatric Association. Let's give a virtual welcome to Dr. Robert Buenaventura. Mabuhay at magandang araw po sa inyo lahat. Ako po si Dr. Bong Buenaventura. Salamat po sa IPCOM, PCP at PPS para sa invitasyon na maging isa sa mga tagapagsalita niyo ngayong hapon. I have been tasked to talk about coping considerations in adulthood during the pandemic. 
My primary objective is to discuss strategies to cope and flourish, not languish, during the pandemic. And these are my secondary objectives. Let me start by describing adulthood. It is actually the longest segment in our lifespan, covering up to 80 years or even more. It is subdivided into early adulthood, middle age, and the elderly or old age. Early adulthood is generally from age 20 to 40. Its main developmental tasks are establishing a career and a long-term relationship. This is the period in which one learns to develop and sharpen one's skills and capabilities. A current motto is you only live once, hence the desire to experience as much as they can during this time period. This is a period of peak performance of our physical and physical skills and capabilities. Middle age, on the other hand, is from age 40 to 60. During this period of life, one may be raising a family and has a stable job. Essentially, the individual is getting settled in his or her life. It is the period of peak maturation of our mental and cognitive skills and capabilities, such that performance can lead to attainment of high levels of positions. It is also called the sandwich generation because the individual is looking after young children and taking care of elderly parents. Old age or the elderly is a very interesting phase of life and can be the longest substage of development and can comprise more than 30 to 40 years, which is twice longer than the stages of childhood and adolescence combined. Thus, we often subdivide it further into three stages, the young old, which is 60 to 70 years of age, the middle old, which is 70 to 80, and the very old, which is beyond 80 years. It is a period marked by resolution and reminiscence with the goal of achieving transcendence. Based on experience with prior pandemics and disasters, we have learned that heightened stress responses during and in the aftermath of a threatening event are associated with adverse physical and mental health. There is a wide range of manifestations of the psychosocial effects of the pandemic on individuals, including anxiety, depression, stress, physical complaints, interpersonal conflicts, and others. I would like to emphasize, however, that fear, worry, and anxiety are common responses to a major health crisis, together with known psychological reactions of stress, loneliness, and agitation. In an online survey done at the Philippine General Hospital and published recently in the Journal of Affective Disorders and using skills for depression, anxiety, stress, and the impact of events, three authors found the following. And these were based on the results of almost 1,900 completed online surveys by adults gathered during the early phase of the COVID-19 pandemic in the Philippines early last year. They found that the 28.8% of respondents reported moderate to severe anxiety levels. 13.4% of respondents reported moderate to severe stress levels. 16.3% of the respondents rated the psychological impact of the outbreak as moderate to severe. And finally, 16.9% of respondents reported moderate to severe depressive symptoms. So as you can see, based on these results, the levels of anxiety, depression, and stress are very high. These effects on people may translate into a range of emotional reactions, such as distress or psychiatric conditions, as we have already mentioned, including unhealthy behaviors such as excessive substance use, and even non-compliance with public health directives, such as quarantine and isolation in people who contract the disease and in the general population. We have also learned that constant fear, worry, and stress can lead to adverse long-term consequences such as deterioration of social networks and economies, stigma and rejection, anger and aggression, and mistrust and paranoia. It is important to remember that some groups may be more vulnerable than others to the psychosocial effects of pandemics, in particular people who contract the disease, those at heightened risk for it, including the elderly, people with compromised immune function, and those living or receiving care in congregate settings such as nursing homes, including people with pre-existing medical, 
psychiatric or substance use problems are an increased risk for adverse psychosocial outcomes. Healthcare providers are also particularly vulnerable to emotional distress in the current pandemic. Given the risk of exposure to the virus, concern about infecting and caring for their loved ones, shortages of personal protective equipment or the PPEs, longer work hours and involvement in emotionally and ethically fraught resource allocation decisions. From an article in a recent issue of the New England Journal of Medicine, these are some of the major stressors that undoubtedly will contribute to widespread emotional distress and increased risk for psychiatric illness associated with COVID-19. The first one is uncertainty about the outcomes and the future. And I'll mention a little bit more about this later on. Followed by severe shortages of resources, lack of protection, imposition of unfamiliar public health measures that infringe on personal freedoms, large and growing financial losses, conflicting messages from authorities. The pandemic has introduced an unexpected new level of uncertainty into all our lives. The obvious downside is that uncertainty on such a massive scale will lead to greater, more intense, and generalized distress in people, especially those with pre-existing mental health conditions. It may also generate further new cases in people who are vulnerable or at risk of developing mental health conditions due to their circumstances. Uncertainty fuels anxiety, causing our mind to conjure up scary scenarios. The pandemic can magnify the angst. As it has become clear that the coronavirus pandemic is here for the foreseeable future, we're all learning to live in a cloud of uncertainty. When can we venture out safely, visit loved ones, go to the doctor, send children back to school, or return to the workplace? Decisions that were once trivial, such as where and when to go grocery shopping, when to visit friends or eat out, have become anxious calculations about risks that can't be fully quantified. Let us look further into salient differences in the psychosocial impact of the pandemic on the three stages of adulthood. In early adulthood, there is a high degree of resiliency due to their youth. However, they have a higher risk of substance use and abuse. In middle age, they are more resourceful and skillful, but may have a higher degree of anxiety and depression due to their increased levels of responsibility as we have mentioned earlier, being the sandwich generation. Finally, with the elderly, they have a higher degree of adaptability due to wisdom, but a higher risk due to age and comorbids, and therefore respond more adversely as well to the issues of isolation and quarantine. Many of us take care of our physical health before we feel sick. We may eat well, exercise, and try to get enough sleep to help maintain wellness. However, we should take the same approach to our mental health. Just as we may work to keep our body healthy, we can also work to keep our mind healthy. Mental health can influence how we feel about ourselves, the world, and our lives, our ability to solve problems and overcome challenges, our ability to build relationships with others and contribute to our communities, and our ability to achieve our goals. Our mental health can affect many different areas of our lives, such as work, school, or home life, relationships with others, vegetative functions such as sleep, appetite, and energy levels, cognitive functions such as our ability to think clearly or make decisions, and including our physical health, of course, and then our life satisfaction and more. Let me emphasize that our mental health is just as important in our lives as our physical health. Allow me also to remind you that mental health is not simply the absence of mental illness. As I mentioned earlier, mental health includes emotional, psychological, social, and cognitive well-being. So let me share a few practical tips. There are a lot, but the following are key recommendations from current guidance and research 
for healthcare workers supporting patients with COVID-related anxiety and quite useful as well for individual self-care. These come from the Center for Evidence-Based Medicine of the University of Oxford in England. First one is to regulate exposure to COVID-related media. We limit exposure to social and mass media reporting of the pandemic. Use only trusted resources to access information about COVID-19. Next is to maintain a strong social network. Connect with family and friends via the telephone or the internet and support others in the community as well. Next is to look after one's body and avoid unhealthy coping strategies. Take care of one's physical health, eat healthy, sleep well, and exercise regularly. Focus on self-care techniques including stress management, meditation, and mindfulness. I hope to have time to be able to demonstrate later on at the end of the lecture an example of this item. So these are just four short practical tips, the most important ones according to the Center for Evidence-Based Medicine. But let me expand those a bit more into the following coping strategies. So we've already mentioned about practicing self-care. This is very basic and one of the most important. So eat right, hydrate, sleep well, exercise, and maintain proper hygiene. And that means taking a bath daily, okay? And if one has maintenance medication, we need to ensure that we take our medications regularly and on time. Focus on timely and accurate information from reliable and credible sources. In this case, for example, the WHO or the DOH. Limit mass media and social media exposure. I learned recently that we tend to check our gadgets or our cell phones at least 10 times every 15 minutes. So that means uh, during the pandemic, we don't need to check our social media like that frequently. Probably three or four times a day would be very sufficient. Then educate oneself and follow recommendations. By this time, all of us know how to wash our hands properly, how to wear face masks and face shields properly as well. And then following recommendations, for example, as far as social distancing is concerned. Reach out and connect with family and friends. Interpersonal connectedness is very crucial at this point in time and can help minimize feelings of isolation and loneliness. And if you know someone who is alone by themselves, reach out to them as well. Engage in enjoyable activities, hobbies, and crafts, particularly with family members or other loved ones. And we know that uh, since last year, there have been a lot of free online resources for this. Think positive, be positive, act on things that one can control because a big factor in terms of individuals feeling very frustrated about the pandemic is a sense of loss of control over daily aspects of their lives. So make decisions, no matter how trivial it is. Make plans, grow up a schedule, develop a routine, but be spontaneous as well. This can be particularly helpful for individuals who are studying and working from home. Be productive, help, volunteer, donate, or share. This can help boost our self-esteem and minimize the sense of frustration that we often feel at this time. Next is to increase self-awareness. So this refers primarily to the principles of mindfulness. You know, monitor one's thoughts, actions, and feelings. Have a quiet time. The best time for this would be at night when you're about to sleep. Pause and listen. Okay, so take the quiet moment. We don't have to be doing anything or everything all the time. Look for one or a few trustworthy individuals who can listen, advise, guide, or help. We all need someone who will be willing to listen to us, who will allow us to be able to vent our frustrations and our fears. And that by itself will be extremely helpful. And then finally, let me share a special group of tips. These last four I feel deserve a special mention. Pray in the silence of our hearts or together with our loved ones or in one single global voice. In a way, prayer is like meditation. For a lot of people, it gives them a calm reassurance that helps soothe their nerves. Be kind to everyone, to ourselves. 
It's often been said that laughter is the best medicine. So find something funny, break the vicious cycle of negativity, and finally find meaning. It could be at this time or it could be later when things have settled down. It is important to be able to make sense of what is happening. I don't want to reinvent the wheel and the resources listed here have already provided comprehensive steps in helping those affected. So may you may Google them for additional details. And all these three agencies have provided uh, major resources, including the Interagency Standing Committee of the United Nations and the Philippine Council for Mental Health and the Department of Health. There are also other resources, including telepsychiatric consultations via apps like SiriusMD or Recovery Hub. And as far as crisis hotlines are concerned, we have three to four major crisis hotlines in the country right now. I'm going to mention primarily the crisis hotline of the National Center for Mental Health in Mandaluyong. The, the advantages of crisis hotlines in general are that they are free, they are confidential, and they are available 24-7 and they are staffed with fully trained counselors. The main drawback, however, is that there could be a waiting period before the call can be answered due to the increased volume of calls at this time. The National Center for Mental Health Crisis Hotline have also upgraded their system, and they are now able to accept landline-to-landline toll-free calls from anywhere in Luzon, and hopefully eventually the entire country, just by dialing 1553, thus making the service more accessible now to those in need. Allow me to end with the following statements. COVID-19 is not just an infectious condition affecting our body, but it has had a very significant impact on other aspects of our lives as well. It is therefore important to address the behavioral, psychological, emotional, and social consequences of this disease. With proper support and cooperation, we will be able to rise above this crisis and move forward with the goal of being able to thrive, not just survive. And we always need to remember that there's no health without mental health. I'd like to close with a letter from Mr. Antonio Gutierrez, the Secretary General of the United Nations, which he wrote last year. Mental health is at the core of our humanity. It enables us to lead rich, fulfilling lives and to participate in our communities. But the COVID-19 virus is not only attacking our physical health, it is also increasing psychological suffering. Grief at the loss of loved ones, shock at the loss of jobs, isolation and restrictions on movement, difficult family dynamics, uncertainty and fear for the future. Mental health problems, including depression and anxiety, are some of the greatest causes of misery in our world. After decades of neglect and underinvestment in mental health services, the COVID-19 pandemic is now hitting families and communities with additional mental stress. Those most at risk are frontline healthcare workers, older people, adolescents, and young people, those with pre-existing mental health conditions, and those caught up in conflict and crisis. We must help them and stand by them. And before I end, I'd like to share a short autogenic session that I hope you'll be able to appreciate. This is a short autogenic session. So if you're sitting down or lying down, just uh, be as comfortable as you can. back and make yourself comfortable. Put your hands on your thighs and now close your eyes. Listen only to my voice and the music. Focus on what I say and follow what I tell you to do. Now think of a place, a place that you love that is serene, quiet, comfortable, a place that makes you feel relaxed, 
It could be on the beach, on a mountain top, even your own bedroom. Now imagine yourself in this place. Imagine yourself in this wonderful, beautiful place. Relaxing, chilling. You feel so good, calm. While you're imagining yourself in this place, let us focus on your breathing. Take slow, deep breaths. Breathe in through your mouth and breathe out through your nose. Breathe in deeply, then breathe out. With that, I'd like to end to end my lecture and to thank you very much for your kind attention. Mabuhay at magandang hapon po sa inyong lahat. Ventura, that was really refreshing, ending in prayer and ending in a mindfulness meditation that will really calm us as EP Calm has done. One question for you, doctor. How has the pandemic adversely affected adults in a work-from-home situation? So the first question is, you mentioned about working from home. How has this pandemic adversely affected adults in this situation? Working from home is something that was not planned, something that we were not used to. And so a lot of people, when they had to work from home, were caught unaware and caught unprepared. In fact, last year at the start of the pandemic, I did several sessions for private companies in terms of helping their employees being able to work from home because it was something I did a lot previous in a, a prior work that I did. So it was very challenging for individuals because they were told to work from home, but they could not become very productive. So they were not meeting a lot of the expectations as far as work was concerned. And so that's why one of the strategies that I mentioned earlier was in terms of making a schedule and being able to create an environment at home that will be conducive to being able to be productive and work from home. So, for example, you can set aside a corner and then designate that as your work area. And then, you know, let everyone know, everyone else at home know that, you know, that you should not be disturbed while you are there because you are actually working. Okay. So, you know, we can also do some bit of role playing as far as working from home is concerned. For example, you wake up at the same time, you break, take a breakfast, you, you shower, you, you dress up, okay? And then, you know, because that will put your mind in a proper perspective as far as uh, being able to concentrate. Because it's going to be a challenge, like if you're working for a moment, you're just wearing sando and shorts. That, that's not going to be very conducive or very helpful. So that's what I advise about being able to work from home. I mean, put your mindset at the right place in terms of uh, consider that particular corner of space at home to be like your office so that when you're there, you could be in a better uh, position in terms of focusing on work that you need to accomplish. Well, and we'd like to have one more song from Martin Nivera, our concert king, our grief, king of grief, as he mentioned, before we have our closing remarks. So please stay. Uh, thank you for all of you who have been listening. And uh, let's have this final song from Martin. Hello, everybody. Martin Yavera here. 
come with me and you be in a world of pure imagination take a look and you will see into your imagination we'll begin with the spin traveling in a world of my creation what we'll see will defy explanation if you want a new paradise simply look around and view it anything you want do it you want to change the world Standing green, number six. Here we go. Come with me and you be in a world of your imagination. Take a look and you'll see into your imagination. We'll begin with the spin, traveling in a world of my creation. What we'll see will defy explanation. If you want to be paradise, simply look around and view it. Anything you want, just do it. You want to change the world, there's nothing to it. There is no life I know to compare with your imagination. Living there, you'll be free if you truly wish to be. On behalf of my entire family, together with the Philippine College of Physicians and the Philippine Pediatric Society, welcome to Understanding Grief 6. The mystery, the journey continues. Hey. Welcome. If you want a new paradise, simply look around and you will. Anything you want to do it. You want to change the world. There's nothing to it. Nothing to it. And that was a great ending to this conference we had today. And now may I please call on Dr. Benjamin Vista for his summation and closing. He is an associate professor of the UP College of Medicine, fellowship in consultation, liaison, psychiatry, addiction, medicine, and psychopharmacology. He was also the past chair of Asian Hospital Department of Psychiatry and is the lead psychiatrist of St. Luke's Medical Center Extension Clinic. Dr. Ben? Hello, everybody. I'm glad you've stayed. And uh, I hope this afternoon has been as enriching for you as it has been for us who have listened to it and who have tried to put it together. I I'd like to first react to the last song of uh, Martin. No? Because uh, right now, you know, there's a term that's being bandied around and our group in EPCOM, when we were preparing for this, we were describing our life now, our lives now as languishing. And one of the treatments for languishing is actually using your imagination and your creation. So 
thank you, Martin, also for uh, all those wonderful songs. And I just like to, I won't speak long. I just like to um, see some uh, consistencies in the presentations this afternoon, right? One is um, stemming from, I think, a quote that our first speaker made regarding uh, grief. No? And it's a quote that she gave from Carl Jung, who said, every change is loss, and every loss must be grieved. So who has not lost in COVID? All of, all of us have lost, and that has been a thread throughout all of the lectures. So all of us are in grief, and particularly now that it's over a year, we are now in prolonged grief. But is it a mental illness? Probably not, because this afternoon you have seen wonderful toolkits that have been given to you to look at the different phases of life. And as I listen to them, one can see that, well, if we use, for example, an analogy that our brains are computers and our brain matter is the hardware and our software is, of course, the mind, the programmers are different at each stage of life. And we have, for example, at infancy, what did we see? Mom. And maybe that, that goes on until the toddler. For the preschool, it's more mom and dad. Dad gets into the picture somehow and they program the child <laughs> or they interact with the child and do all of those things that our wonderful speaker said. During uh, the school age, when they enter school, it's the teachers who become their programmers. And then when they become adolescents, it's the peers who become their programmers. Then you go into early adulthood, and that's, of course, the partner. And then when you go into the late stages of adulthood, it becomes the children again. And the toolkits I will not go through anymore because I think all of you um, have taken notes on that, and they were very wonderful lectures on that. But I just like to close with just two quotes, because if we're all in grief, uh, I don't think a grief session can end without a quotation from Elizabeth Kubler-Ross. So may permit me to quote her. And she says, the reality is that you will grieve forever. You will not get over a loss of a loved one. You will learn how to live with it. You will heal and you will rebuild yourself around the loss that you have suffered. You will be whole again, but you will never be the same. Nor should you be the same. Nor should you want to. And finally, uh, before anything else, I'd like, before I say the, the last quote that I have prepared as my reaction, I would really like to acknowledge the, the fantastic work for, for our moderator, for example, Dr. Francis de Malanta. Thank you for a wonderful job of moderating. Of all the speakers, of course, um, Mitchell Duran, the executive director of Ep EPCOM, and of course, Sunny Ku, the director for resource mobilization of EPCOM, and of course, the PCP tech team, Jeremias Asumbado, Gerald Ferrer and Jelaika Dumaraos, maraming maraming salamat po. Ang galing-galing ninyong gumawa ng trabaho ninyo. At kami ay nagpapasalamat talaga na nandyan kayo kasi kung wala kayo, wala, hindi talaga ito mangyayari. Okay. So I will close perhaps not with a prayer but a, a quote from Fyodor Dostoevsky, one of my favorite authors. Referring to grief, just two lines. He says, the darker the night, the brighter the stars. 
the deeper the grief, the closer is God. And may God bless all of us in this pandemic and moving forward. God bless us, everyone. Bye. Thank you, Dr. Ben, for being the advisor to this program that we put together. And thank you to everyone. Can you allow me to say just a few more things in closing? I have come across a profound and stirring post three days ago, which best summarizes our current situation. And I quote, We are all navigating through a storm, but we are not in the same boat. The waves may capsize your boat while gently rocking my boat or vice versa. For some, quarantine is a moment of reflection, of reconnection. For others, this is a desperate crisis. Some experience, experience it as loneliness and isolation. Others, a time of reconnection with family and friends. Some lament the absence of a brand they love. Others worry about bread for the weekend or if noodles will last a few more days. Some work in their home office. Others have lost their homes and offices. We criticize those who break the quarantine, but some have no choice. They have to pay the bills. Others choose to escape to their country homes or favorite vacation destinations. Some have experienced the virus. Some have already lost someone from it. Some are not sure their loved ones are going to make it. And yet, there are some who don't even believe this is a big deal. Many are getting vaccinated. Some have faith in God and miracles. Others lack faith in science. Some think the storm is passing. Others think the worst is yet to come. So friends, we are not in the same boat. We are in the same storm. How we perceive it depends on the boat we are on. And when the storm passes, Each of us will emerge in our own way, some stronger, some unscathed, some scarred, some on a stretcher, and some will not make it. It is very important to see beyond our own experience, see beyond our politics, beyond religion, beyond race, beyond the nose on our faces. Do not underestimate the pain of others, even if we do not feel it ourselves. Do not judge the good life of one, nor condemn the choices of the other. Let us not judge the one who lacks, nor the one with possessions. We are simply on different boats. Let us navigate our routes together with respect, with empathy, with responsibility, and with steadfast faith in God. Thank you very much, everyone, for listening and for EPCOM, PCP, and PPS. Thank you and see you again next year.